a new study has just made the sweetest discovery ever. Newly born exoplanets might actually look like Smarties, that popular British candy rather than spheres. We've always kind of assumed that baby planets are born ball-shaped, but they might be oblate spheroids instead. A team of scientists from the University of Central Lancashire in England used computer simulations to build a model of the formation of planets in dense gas disks surrounding young stars. After that, they compared these models with actual observations and noticed that the young planets took shapes that defied any expectations. The thing is that even though more than 5,000 exoplanets have been discovered so far, astronomers still don't have a clear understanding of the sequence of events marking their birth and early evolution. But this new research might finally shed light on this process. After examining the formation mechanisms of gas giant planets like Jupiter, the team came to the conclusion that planets built up from their centers. After that, the researchers focused on the initial shapes of such planets. They were also interested in how they could encourage the growth of planetary seeds, resulting in the appearance of massive planets, sometimes larger than our solar system's largest giants. The standard theory of the formation of planets suggests that such growth occurs gradually and smoothly. First, dust particles start sticking together, forming progressively larger and larger objects. This process lasts for a very long time and is known as core accretion. It's the model of planet formation scientists favor. There's another theory, according to which planet's birth might happen over shorter periods of time. This idea involves a protoplanetary disk, a disk of gas, which makes up 99% of its mass, and dust, around 1%. This disk orbits a newly formed star, and planets are hypothesized to form from this cloud. Protoplanetary disks are believed to be common byproducts of star formation and range in mass from 0.001 to 0.3 solar masses. Inside such disks, matter slowly moves inward, and dust particles grow bigger to the size of pebbles. At one point, after 2 to 3 million years, a giant rotating protoplanetary disk breaks into pieces, and that's how baby planets are born. This theory is known as the disk instability method. The model built by the team seems to support this second, less favored theory rapid planet formation through disk instability. All because this theory explains how large planets can form relatively quickly at pretty large distances from their host stars. As for the weird flattened shape of these newly formed planets, it might be due to the material falling onto them. Most likely, it goes mainly to the poles of new planets. One of the main conclusions drawn by the research is that the appearance of young exoplanets as we see them from Earth may vary depending on how they are angled. If Earth is directed face-on to an exoplanet, it will seem that the latter has a traditional spherical shape. But if seen on edge, a baby exoplanet will look like a real smarty. The team is going to continue to investigate the formation of planets with the help of an improved computer model. They believe they will find out the role the environment around a young planet plays in affecting its shape and formation. Observations of young planets, which are often still surrounded by gas and dust, have become possible only recently. All thanks to such telescopes as the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, the ALMA Telescope, and the Very Large Telescope. These observatories might provide additional data to support the Smarties theory. By the way, the construction of the ALMA telescope involved thousands of scientists and engineers from all over the world and lasted more than 10 years. The observatory is among the highest instruments in the world at an altitude of 16,570 feet above sea level. This puts it above much of Earth's atmosphere, which tends to blur and distort light, disrupting observations. Plus, ALMA is located in Chile's Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on our planet. That's why, almost every night, the sky is clear of clouds and free of light-distorting moisture. Now, Jupiter used to be flat and look like an M&M candy. Now I'm hungry. And it wasn't the only flat pattern in our solar system. Turns out, there are tons of things that can go wrong during a planet's formation, like locking up to the sun or getting whooshed into open space. Let's check it out.
The Earth isn't flat, but Jupiter might have been. Instead of being a big round ball, gas giants in our system might have started more like flat pancakes. Jupiter is one of the oldest of our neighbors. It's 4.6 billion years old, just like our Sun. And when it was just a baby planet, it likely formed through a process called disk instability. It all begins with stars. When a star is forming, it doesn't look like a round object. It's more like a big disk of stuff. During this stage, really hot winds made of charged particles blow out. The dust in that disk contains stuff like carbon and iron. Some of them collide and stick together, forming bigger objects. Dust turns into pebbles, pebbles turn into rocks, and rocks bump into each other, getting bigger. Gas in the disks helps all these solid bits stick together. Some break apart, but others stick around, and they're the ones that become the basic pieces of planets. They're called planetesimals. Even gas giants like Jupiter started off as tiny specks of dust, smaller than a human hair. Eventually, they formed their own big ring-shaped disks of gas. They began to spin around our sun, growing bigger by gathering gas and rocks like snowballs. Gas giants are special. They were born from the colder parts of the disk. In cold areas, molecules are slower, which makes them easier to grab. In these places, water could freeze, and tiny ice pieces stick together and are mixed with dust. These dirty snowballs gather up and then form cores of huge planets, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In the warmer areas closer to the star, rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars start to form. After the icy giants were born, there wasn't much gas left for these smaller planets. It might take tens of millions of years for these rocky planets to form after the star is born. And our sun was growing at the same time, sucking up nearby gas and pushing far away stuff even farther out. After billions of years, the disk changed completely, turning into a round star with a bunch of planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, moons, meteoroids, and comets around it. Recently, simulations showed that these protoplanets, as these early dust balls are called, don't start off looking like the planets we know. In the case of gas giants like Jupiter, they look more like squashed balls or M&M's candies, not the peanut kind. When the sun was young, the disk of gas and dust surrounding it cooled down and became unstable. It started breaking into big chunks. These chunks dramatically collapsed together under huge gravity to create Jupiter. It became a round gas giant over time. There are a lot of oddities that can happen during that process of planet formation. Ever wonder why Venus or Uranus spin in the opposite way compared to other planets? Usually, when things form from a spinning disk of gas, they tend to spin in the same direction. For example, if you spin a bunch of balls on a string, they all twirl in the same way. So, theoretically, all planets should spin in the same direction too. But there are a lot of fast-moving objects like comets and asteroids in our solar system. When they smash into planets, especially during their early days, this collision might send the planets to spin in the opposite direction. Venus and Uranus probably survived a massive collision. Luckily, they weren't repelled to outer space. The gravity from the Sun and nearby planets pulled them back into place. There are also so-called tidally locked planets. These are celestial bodies that spin in a way where one side always faces their star while the other side remains in perpetual darkness. So one side is always very hot while the other is extremely cold. Hmm. If we were on a planet like that, we would only be able to live on a thin line in between. These planets form when they're very close to their star. The gravitational forces are extremely strong and, over time, these forces slow down the planet's rotation until it matches the time it takes to orbit the star. Imagine you're spinning in your chair. Someone comes up to you and, holding onto your chair with their hands, starts spinning with you. This way, you'll always face each other. Tidally locked planets kind of work like that. Our moon is tidally locked to our Earth, which is why we only see one side of it. We've discovered more than 5,000 planets outside of our solar system called exoplanets. Some of them have very strange orbits. For example, 
planets with incredibly long orbits, thousands of years to make one trip around the star, or very wonky, comet-like orbits, or so-called hot Jupiters. They're super close to their star, way closer than Mercury is to our Sun. But these planets couldn't have formed where they are now. As their solar system evolved, they changed their positions for some reason. This rearranging is called planetary migration. There are three main ways this migration happens. First, because of the gas and dust spinning around the planet. When a planet is bumping into this stuff, it can create spiral patterns in the gas. These patterns can either push the planet closer to the center or farther away, depending on how they mix together. It's called a gas-driven migration. This is what Jupiter experienced when it moved closer to the Sun billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This also explains the existence of hot Jupiters. Second, big planets can shove the smaller ones, changing their paths. Third, the star's gravity can tug on the planet, making its orbit more circular. Ever heard of rogue planets? Imagine a lonely planet floating in the vastness of space without a star to call home. They're like the wandering nomads of our galaxy, doomed to drift around forever. And there are so many of them, there might be more free-floating planets than ones that are tied to stars. We're talking trillions of rogue planets hanging out in our Milky Way galaxy alone. They're often as massive as our biggest planet, Jupiter. But most of them might be Earth-sized. Some might even have thick atmospheres that keep them warm, even though they're far from any star. Some of them might have wild auroras, while others could host moons with liquid water, a potential haven for life. There's even a chance that they might contain extraterrestrial life. These planets might bump into other stars or even entire planetary systems as they journey through space. Sometimes they might get caught in a star's gravity for a while before getting flung back out into space. But how are they born? Sometimes, during this chaotic process of planet formation, not all planets can manage to stay close to their parent stars. Some of them get kicked out of their solar systems due to powerful gravitational interactions with other planets or passing stars. These ejected planets become rogue planets. In 2012, astronomers found a solar system from the very beginning of the universe. This system included a star and two planets. We called it a fossil system. The star is super old, about 13 billion years, almost as old as our entire universe. It was mostly made of just hydrogen and helium. This is unusual because planets usually form from clouds of gas that contain heavier stuff. That's when we figured out that the way planets formed before was different from how they form now. We know that stars with more metals are more likely to have planets. In astronomy lingo, metals means any chemical element other than hydrogen and helium. But in the early universe, there weren't many metals. Most of them were created inside stars and then spread out into space when those stars blew up. So when did the very first planets form? This newly discovered system helps answer these questions. Its two giant planets are orbiting a star that's incredibly low in metals and extremely old. This should be really rare, if not impossible, but they exist. This means that maybe there are more planets in metal-poor systems than we thought. Studying them will help us learn more about the history of planet formation. Have you ever wondered why all planets are perfectly round? And what if these celestial bodies decided to break the rules and change their shape? Would we end up with square planets, triangular moons, or maybe even intergalactic shapes we can't even imagine? Well, let's find out. So how do planets form in the first place? The universe is filled with swirling clouds of dust and gas. These clouds, called molecular clouds, consist of various elements and compounds such as hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, and so on. They're like a cosmic kitchen filled with the ingredients needed to cook up some brand new planets. The first step in the recipe for planetary formation is called the accretion theory. Let's say that something happens that causes gravitational instability. Like a supernova goes off nearby or something. This pushes the gas and dust in the cloud and causes them to come together. Because of gravity, these particles start falling toward a central point. They become more tightly packed together. Like when you squeeze a ball in your hand. And eventually, 
They're squeezed so hard that the cloud starts to flatten into a disc shape. Kind of like when you mix flour and water to make pizza dough. This disc is called a protoplanetary disc. It's also spinning because the cloud's particles had some rotation to begin with. Now, imagine these tiny dust particles and gas molecules dancing around in the disc. Sometimes, they bump into each other. And when they do, they stick together like Velcro. These little clumps of dust and gas are called planetesimals. They're the building blocks of planets. And as the planetesimals continue to collide and merge, they grew larger and larger, forming protoplanets. The protoplanets were getting serious about their size, and their gravity became stronger. Some of them got so massive that they became the grand masters of their cosmic neighborhoods, the planets we know and love. Each planet had its own unique recipe of gases, rocks, and sometimes even water. But why do the planets look like spheres? Well, it's all because of gravity. Let's go back to our protoplanets. Imagine you're squeezing a balloon with your hands. The air inside of the balloon pushes back, creating pressure. Something similar happens with planets. Gravity squeezes its material inward, pulling in towards the center. And since gravity acts equally in all directions, it pulls material from all sides toward the center of mass, resulting in a sphere-like shape. And that material pushes back with pressure, resisting the force of gravity. In the end, they both find a sweet spot where they balance each other out. It's called hydrostatic equilibrium, a fancy term that means everything inside a planet is in balance. But that's not all. Another thing that makes the planet spherical is their rotation. Think about a ball of Play-Doh or something like that. Imagine you spin it rapidly. The material starts to push outward, making the Play-Doh bulge at the equator and flatten at the poles. The same thing happens to planets. As they spin on their axes, the combination of gravity and rotation pushes the material outward, making the planet bulge at the equator. They low-key want to become disks again. However, gravity doesn't want any lumpy planets. It wants them to be nice and round, so it keeps pulling on the material, trying to make everything as compact as possible. Eventually, gravity wins, and the planet settles into a spherical shape. Let's take some examples from our planetary playlist. Jupiter, the giant of the solar system, loves to show off its ablateness. It spins so fast that it becomes noticeably squished at the poles and chubby in the middle. It's like a spinning top with a cute belly. Saturn, the ringed wonder, also joins the oblate party. It spins around with its beautiful rings, and its ablateness is even more pronounced than Jupiter's. These examples show how rotation can give planets a unique shape. They go from being perfectly round to having a delightful bulge around the middle. It's like cosmic pottery, where the spinning motion creates a playful and distinct shape. So, now you know why the planets are round. But what's more interesting is, what if they weren't? What if they were, let's say, cubical? Or even triangular? Well, let's see. A cube-shaped, or a triangle-shaped planet would have its mass spread out in a completely different way than a sphere. And you know what that means? Gravity would be all shook up too. On a spherical planet, Gravity pulls everything towards the center because the mass is evenly distributed around that center. But when we introduce a cube-shaped or triangle-shaped planet, things get interesting. If you're standing at the center of one of those faces, you'd feel the strongest pull of gravity. That's because the faces are the closest to the center of gravity. And as you venture away from the center and start walking towards the edges, gravity starts playing tricks on you. You would feel the struggle against the steep-angled gravity. Walking on those edges would feel just like climbing a mountain or walking on a super steep slope. All because gravity wants you right in the middle of the face and nowhere else. Now imagine the terrain along the edges and corners. It's a barren, rocky, and dry landscape. Why? Well, all the water would pool in at the center of each face, leaving the edges high and dry. And the air quality? Well, it's either non-existent or so thin that it can't support life. Not the coziest place to set up camp, that's for sure. And don't forget your warm clothes, lunch, and hiking boots. You'll need them because of the crazy climate. The type of climate you'll encounter on our cube or triangle-shaped Earth depends on how it spins. If it rotates at its corners, each side would enjoy a mild, temperate climate. However, if it rotates on an axis through two of its faces, things get intense. Picture a roller coaster version of our current climate. Some faces would be polar wonderlands, icy and chilly. 
the top and bottom faces for the cube, and the bottom face for the triangle. Meanwhile, the other sides would be completely different. In a cube, they would be scorching hot with an equatorial climate that would make you break a sweat. Instead of sunlight gently curving along the surface, it would directly beam onto these faces. Talk about feeling the heat. And on a triangular planet, the sunlight would strike the faces at an angle. This angled sunlight would create fascinating temperature variations across the planet. Imagine this. As you move from the base of the triangle towards the tip, the temperatures would gradually decrease. The base, where the sunlight hits most directly, would be the hottest region, just like the equatorial climate we're familiar with on our spherical Earth. But as you venture towards the tip, the angle of sunlight would be less direct, leading to cooler temperatures. But the base is still super cold and dark, since the sunlight doesn't directly reach it. So the triangle would be absolutely crazy in terms of temperature changes and climate zones. By the way, you know that cozy blanket of air we call the atmosphere? Well, on our angular Earth, things would get a little topsy-turvy. Gravity would be pulling stronger from the center of each face. The result? The atmosphere would go through some crazy changes. Picture this. At the center of each face where gravity is strongest, the atmosphere would gather and thicken. It would be like a bustling city, full of air molecules. But as you venture towards the edges, things would start to thin out. The atmosphere would become scarce and very thin. So breathing along the edges would be quite a challenge, and the edges would be a tough neighborhood for life to thrive. Moreover, a thinner atmosphere means less protection from the sun's radiation and solar winds, so corners and edges would be extremely dangerous for humans. Of course, this is all just a playful exploration of what could be. Our Earth loves its spherical shape, and that's a good thing. But there's no harm in imagining wild and wonderful possibilities. So keep your imagination soaring and continue to marvel at the marvels of our amazing planet, however it may be shaped. An exoplanet is any planet inside our solar system. Some of them are free-floating. Those are called rogue planets. They move around the galactic center. Others orbit their host star, or two. For the first time, astronomers discovered exoplanets in the 1990s. Since then, scientists have found thousands of them. And now, you can sneak a peek too. Spoiler alert, some exoplanets are pretty bizarre. Other resemble our home planet and could probably support life. The closest to Earth exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. It's a mere 4.2 light years away from Earth. Recently, astronomers have found out that this world might resemble Earth even more than previously thought. It's only 17% more massive than our home planet. It orbits a star that is dimmer and less massive than the Sun. Proxima Centauri b is in the middle of the star's habitable zone. This means that chances are liquid water and life might exist on the planet. It looks like the exoplanet is tidally locked with its parent star. This means one of its sides faces the star at all times, and the other is always in the darkness. Scientists haven't figured out yet whether the planet has an atmosphere. It's traveling too close to its star and completes one orbit within 11 Earth days. The radiation from the star might be pulling the planet's air away. If this is the case, Proxima Centauri b isn't likely to have liquid water on its surface. Gleis 832c is 16 light years away from Earth. In the cosmic scheme of things, it's a stone's throw away. This exoplanet is five times as massive as Earth and travels much closer to its parent star. That's why a year on this planet lasts a mere 36 days. But since this star is a red dwarf, much cooler and dimmer than the Sun, Gliese 832c gets as much light and heat as our planet does. At the same time, it's still unclear if Gliese 832c is similar to Earth. It probably has a much thicker atmosphere that creates a runaway greenhouse effect. This phenomenon occurs when a planet absorbs more heat from its host star than it can release back into space. This means that Gliese 832c is more likely to resemble scorching hot Venus rather than relatively cool Earth. Another Earth-like planet, TOI 700d, is 100 light years away from us in the constellation Dorado. It orbits a small and rather cool dwarf star that is about 40% of the mass and size of the Sun. Its surface temperature is half as high as that of our star. The outermost planet, 
which is the very TOI-700D, is almost the size of Earth. It also sits in the habitable zone of its parent star. No flares from TOI-700 reach the planet. This increases the chances of the exoplanet being habitable. This means it can potentially develop and maintain life. Scientists don't know for sure the exact conditions on the surface of the planet, but one of the computer simulations they've created shows a planet covered with an ocean. It has a very dense atmosphere dominated by carbon dioxide. Astronomers think a similar atmosphere surrounded Mars when it was a young planet. But another 3D model shows TOI-700D as an all-land, cloudless world. That's what our Earth would probably look like if it wasn't covered with oceans. Winds on TOI-700D move away from the night side of the planet and meet in the area that directly faces the star. There is an exoplanet that stands out among the rest because of its awesome magenta color. You can find this world in the Virgo constellation. The planet is called Gliese 504b. The distance between this planet and its parent star is nine times the distance between the Sun and Jupiter. The planet formed relatively recently and is still glowing with heat. That's why its surface looks pinkish. Just 20 light years away from the Sun, which isn't such a great distance when we talk about space, a bizarre rogue planet is roaming our home Milky Way galaxy. But even though this planet doesn't orbit any star, it still has an incredibly powerful magnetic field. It's 4 million times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. The exoplanet also produces amazing auroras. When it was discovered in 2016, astronomers were almost sure they had detected a brown dwarf which is an object too large to be a planet and too small to be a star. But later, scientists received proof that the space object wasn't big enough to be a brown dwarf. The planet sure is a mammoth among its peers. It's 1.2 times as wide as the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, and more than 12 times as heavy. Astronomers think the exceptional strong magnetic field helps the planet produce the auroras. But the most curious thing is that they're generated in a different way than auroras on Earth. It might be because the exoplanet's moon helps the planet create these light shows. If you traveled 20,000 light years away from Earth, you'd come close to a red dwarf in the Sagittarius constellation. Such stars are very cool and small. Quite far away from this cold star, there's a planet. The distance between this world and its host star is so great that the planet receives very little heat. It's one of the coldest planets ever detected. The average surface temperature on the planet is lower than negative 360 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why the entire planet is covered with a thick layer of ice. If you stepped onto its surface, you'd see nothing but glaciers, plains, and mountains of ice. And still, astronomers claim life might exist deep beneath the frozen surface. All because the core of the planet is likely to generate enough heat to melt some of its inner ice. In this case, there would be an enormous subsurface ocean, maybe even swarming with bizarre life forms on the planet. One of the oldest exoplanets we know about is PCR B162026b. It's about 12.7 billion years old. It's almost three times as old as Earth, which appeared 4.5 billion years ago. This also means that the Genesis planet formed only about one billion years after the Big Bang. The planet is so old that its two parent stars have had enough time to evolve into a white dwarf and a pulsar, making almost 100 revolutions per second. Sunrises on this planet must look awesome I bet the next exoplanet isn't like any other you might have seen before. It's often called Super Saturn, or Saturn on steroids. That's because J1407b has a colossal system of rings. They're 640 times as large as those of Saturn. The bizarre world is 434 light years away from Earth. It's the only planet we know about that has rings similar to Saturn's. If you moved J1407b to our solar system and replaced Saturn with it, its rings would look many times larger than a full moon.
astronomers have noticed a gap halfway through the planet's rings. The chances are high that an exomoon the size of Mars orbits the planet somewhere within this gap. If you lived on this moon, you'd have an awesome view every time you looked up into the sky. This exoplanet, called WASP-12b, munches on the light coming from its star. It's one of the darkest worlds people know about. All because its day side consumes light rather than reflects it back into space. The planet is giant, twice the size of Jupiter, and it traps more than 94% of the light that reaches its atmosphere. This is likely to be the main reason for the insane temperatures on the surface of the planet. They can rise up to 4,600 degrees Fahrenheit. It's almost half as hot as the surface of the Sun. WASP-12b travels so close to its host star that it needs just one day to complete one orbit. Its night side isn't as hot as the day side, a mere 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of this difference in temperature, water vapor and clouds gather above the surface of the planet. From time to time, swirls of material from the planet's superheated atmosphere spill onto its star. About 4,000 light-years away from Earth, there's an exoplanet that might be one enormous diamond. It's five times the size of our planet, but needs only two hours and ten minutes to orbit its parent star. It's a pulsar rotating at a rate of 10,000 times a minute. The planet is denser than any other we've discovered so far. It consists mostly of carbon, which is so dense that astronomers think it might be crystalline. If it was true, it could mean that at least some part of the planet is diamond. On WASP-76b, it rains iron on the night side of the planet, and the temperature on the daytime side rises up to 4,300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to vaporize most metals. This exoplanet is a bit smaller than Jupiter and located 640 light-years away from Earth. Such terrifying weather conditions in this world are caused by its unusual orbit. The distance between WASP-76b and its parent star is 10 times shorter than the distance between Mercury and the Sun. That's why the star and the huge planet are tidally locked. One side of WASP-76b always faces the star, and the other side is always pitch black. This bright blue exoplanet sits 62 years away from Earth. A bit larger than Jupiter, it looks calm and peaceful. Its blue color might remind you of our home planet. But this familiar appearance conceals the planet's horrifying nature. The beautiful hue comes from silicate atoms and particles that make up the atmosphere. But the wind speed on the planet can reach 5,400 miles per hour. That's seven times the speed of sound. The temperature there can rise up to 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. But this isn't the worst. In this bizarre world, it rains glass, sideways. So it's probably not the place where you'd like to spend your vacation. For thousands of years, people knew only about the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which they could see using simple telescopes, or even by the naked eye, if conditions were good. But in the late 18th century, a famous astronomer named Sir William Herschel discovered a new planet that was icy blue in color. At first, people thought it was a star, but later they realized it was a planet. Today, we know it as Uranus, a planet that's more than 19 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. It's so far away that it takes Uranus 84 years to complete one trip around the Sun. This astronomer also discovered many other interesting things in space, like double stars and nebulae. In the mid-1800s, scientists noticed something pulled Uranus and strangely tugged its orbit. They thought there must be another planet out there, and they used math to predict where it would be. Finally, in 1846, they found Neptune using a telescope. It was too faint to see with the naked eye, because it was too far away from the Sun. It was all so exciting! Who knows how many other planets could be there, lurking in the darkness of our solar system? Back in the mid-1800s, astronomers noticed something unusual was happening in the sky. A small, rocky planet named Mercury was behaving strangely. It didn't follow the predictable orbit that was expected of it. 
One of the astronomers was a brilliant French scientist named Urbain Le Verrier. He came up with a theory that there could be another planet in our solar system no one had yet discovered. It would be located somewhere between Mercury and the Sun. This hypothetical planet, which he named Vulcan after the Roman god of fire, would have an incredibly hot surface. And it could be a potential explanation for Mercury's strange behavior. He never surely claimed Vulcan was really the one thing disturbing the orbit of Mercury. But, excited by the possibility of discovering a new planet, astronomers all over the world took the idea of Vulcan. For a planet that didn't exist, people committed to developing ideas and getting information about it. Some scientists didn't think it was likely that they had missed another planet as big as Mercury. It would have been hard not to see it by then. But there was a tiny chance of a smaller planet existing inside Mercury's orbit that was too close to the Sun, so no one could see it. One theory said it was about 13 million miles away from the Sun. Mercury is the planet with the most eccentric orbit in our solar system, but the closest point it gets to the Sun is about 28.5 million miles. This means Vulcan would be under half of that distance. The theory moved on, saying that if Vulcan existed, it would orbit the Sun every 19 days and 18 hours, and its path would be tilted about 12 degrees relative to the path of other planets in our solar system. Vulcan's position at its furthest point from the Sun would still be too close to the Sun to be seen with the naked eye, even during twilight. The only chance of seeing Vulcan would be during a solar eclipse, or when it passed in front of the Sun, which, as the theory said, would be two to four times a year. They had a theory that this mysterious planet was so close to the Sun that it could only be seen during a total solar eclipse when the Moon blocked out the Sun's blinding glare. So, every time there was an eclipse, scientists would peer at the Sun, hoping to catch a glimpse of Vulcan. They were trying really hard, but no matter what, they couldn't find this mysterious planet. Some astronomers claimed to have spotted it during eclipses, but no one could ever confirm or find evidence for that. The theory of Vulcan was left waiting for some better times. Einstein had a different idea. You know about his theory of general relativity, right? That's where he claimed gravity wasn't some sort of natural force, but a result of space-time curved because of the presence of giant space objects, like planets and stars. Planets circle around the Sun in their usual orbit because space-time is curved. That means the planets are kind of falling towards the central star of our solar system. And Einstein tried to explain Mercury's unusual orbit using his own theory of relativity. Unlike the other planets in our solar system, Mercury's orbit wasn't that circular. Instead, it seemed to wobble slightly as if there was an invisible force pulling it away. Einstein said this could be happening because the massive gravity of our Sun was actually curving the fabric of space-time around it. He claimed it's possible this changed Mercury's orbit a little bit. It took the scientific community a while to test this theory, but it eventually seemed like the most plausible explanation. Even though Einstein's theory gave us a more elegant explanation for Mercury's strange orbit, some scientists were still holding out hope for Vulcan. It was especially hard to let go of the idea of Vulcan because Mercury is also the planet that's really hard to see from where we're standing. But later, more and more scientists started accepting Einstein's theory above their imagination. And they would observe a total solar eclipse specifically to test Einstein's theory of relativity not because of Vulcan. And Vulcan is not the only hypothetical planet everyone was talking about. In the newer age, some believe there could be a mysterious planet lurking in the outer part of our solar system. But this one is more likely to exist. No one has seen it directly yet, but computer simulations show this so-called Planet 9, or Planet X, is probably somewhere there beyond Neptune. Neptune and Planet X could be similar in size. Planet X could be 10 times more massive than Earth and circles around our Sun in an elongated shape, which is on average 20 times farther from the Sun than Neptune. A year there 
may last between 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years. By comparison, a year on Neptune lasts 165 Earth years. Something this big moving out there beyond Neptune could explain the unusual orbits of smaller objects in the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is the area of our solar system beyond Neptune and where it orbits. And there are most likely many asteroids, comets, and some other smaller bodies there, mostly made of ice. There was another hypothetical planet called Nibiru. Remember those rumors that the world could end back in 2012? One of the popular scenarios was Nibiru, which some claimed would hit our home planet at the end of the year. Of course, nothing happened. We're still here, all set and good, but the idea of Nibiru seemed interesting. Stories started in the 1970s when a man named Zachariah Sitchin mentioned Nibiru in his book, The Twelfth Planet, claiming it orbits the sun every 3,600 years. But there's no chance a planet with such an eccentric orbit wouldn't disrupt other planets in our solar system with its gravity. And if it was really coming that close to Earth in 2012, we were supposed to be able to see it with the naked eye. Some simple calculations showed Nibiru would have been nearly as bright as Mars at its dimmest and brighter than the faintest stars you see from a city. Oh well, maybe we'll have more luck in the next 3,500 and something years. In 2011, a comet named Elenin appeared that many people thought could be Nibiru. But when you're looking at comets and planets through a telescope, you see they appear differently. A comet has a coma, which is a gas atmosphere, together with a tail, something a planet doesn't have. Plus, this comet didn't slam into the Earth. It came too close to our Sun and fell apart. The leftover pieces will continue moving on their way to the outer solar system for the next 12,000 years. Now, space missions used to be this big deal, but now they're starting to feel like a walk in the park. But there's a catch. Our bodies aren't exactly built for surviving on other planets. Now, I know what you're thinking. Our bodies will eventually adapt and evolve, right? Well, yeah, evolution is always on the clock. But let's be real here, it's not going to happen overnight. We're not talking about a cool million years for some changes to kick in. And honestly, who's got the time for that? So, how about tweaking our genes just a little bit to make living on other planets easier? Genetic modifications are all about changing an organism's genetic material, like its DNA, to give it some cool new traits or characteristics. Now, picture this. Scientists could totally mess around with our genes to make us more resistant to crazy temperatures. You know, like the temperature fluctuations of the moon, minus 298 degrees Fahrenheit at night, to 224 degrees Fahrenheit daytime. Wow. They might even figure out a way to make us super tough against radiation, which is a huge deal in space or on planets with weak atmospheres. We definitely don't want to get fried out there. Oh, and here's another thing they could do. Tackle the effects of low gravity. Spending too much time in low gravity can really mess up our muscles, bones, and even our heart. But if they tweak those genes related to muscle and bone growth, we could become super strong and resistant to all those nasty effects. However, it's not as simple as it might seem. The technology for safe and precise genetic modifications is still in its early stages, so it might even take as much time as it would for our bodies to naturally evolve and adapt to other planets. There are a couple of nice exoplanets where humanity might potentially live. I'm talking about Gliese 667cc, Kepler 442b, Kepler 62a, Kepler 452b, Gliese 837, you name it. In fact, I'm sure you can do a better job of naming than these. Now consider Gliese 667cc. Um, in fact, let's nickname this one Gary for short. Turns out that Gary gets about 90% of the light that Earth does. But instead of regular visible light, this planet mostly gets infrared light. To put it simpler, Gary is rocking only 20% of the visible light that Earth gets. Yep, it's a bit darker over there. So, do we need really warm clothes and night vision goggles to thrive on this planet? Nah, not really. In addition to darkness, Gary is estimated to have a higher mass than Earth, meaning it likely has a stronger gravitational pull. 
To adapt, humans would need to hit the gym at least twice a day. Translation? Humans would need to develop stronger muscles and bones to withstand the increased gravity. Over generations, natural selection might favor individuals with these adaptations. We still know too little about these exoplanets to move there anytime soon. Hey, how about some planets in our solar system? Let's discover our top picks. This way, we can easily figure out what changes we need to make. So, first things first, let's eliminate the two ice giants in our solar system and their friends. Yep, Neptune, Uranus, and the two gas giants Saturn and Jupiter. Sorry guys, but terraforming you is just not gonna happen. Even so, we still have four super cool candidates right here in our solar system. You all know them well. Venus and Mars, the popular kids on the block. And then we have Jupiter's moon, Callisto, and Saturn's moon, Titan. They might not be as famous, but they've got some serious potential to become Earth 2.0. So, it turns out some of Jupiter's moons are super cool for terraforming. They're packed with water, which is a big plus. But here's the catch. Only Callisto is far enough from Jupiter's radiation belt. You see, on Earth, we get hit with about 0.24 rems of radiation per year. But, for instance, Ganymede, another of Jupiter's moons, gives away a whopping 8 rems per day. Just to make it clear, professional workers here on Earth can have more than 5 rem per year. Callisto is different, though. We don't need to tweak our genes, as it only gets about 0.01 rems per day, which we humans can totally handle. Now, let's not get too carried away with the idea that life on Callisto is all sunshine and beaches, like in California. Nope, it's more like an icy wonderland out there. So if you ever find yourself on Callisto, make sure to pack your snazziest protective clothing and some high-tech heating systems. Honestly, at this point, we might as well wish for evolution to take us back to our furry animal days. I mean, think about it. Our ancestors were rocking some serious fur game, just like those cool chimps and gorillas. But as time went on and we got all fancy with our evolution, we decided to ditch the fur coat and go for a more minimalist look. Now, why did we lose our fur? That's a question that has puzzled scientists for ages. Darwin thought it was about finding less hairy mates, while others believed it was to keep those pesky lice away. But these days, most researchers think it all comes down to staying cool. Picture this. Our ancestors were strutting their stuff on open, dry lands after they learned to walk on two legs. Think of a patchy forest or a sunny savanna instead of a lush rainforest. In that kind of environment, overheating was a real threat. So we evolved to have less body hair and more sweat glands to help us cool down by sweating like crazy. Now Titan, the moon of Saturn, is like a treasure chest of resources just waiting to be cracked open. We're talking hydrocarbon reserves that make Earths look like a kid's play, with petroleum for days. Plus, it's got all sorts of organic compounds like methane, ammonia, and water. And don't forget its atmosphere is a nitrogen party, just like early Earths. Here's where it gets really interesting. If Titan's atmosphere is similar to what Earth used to be, we could totally transform it into a modern Earth-like atmosphere. Picture this, giant mirrors in space beaming sunlight onto Titan's surface, heating things up and releasing water vapor. Oxygenated atmosphere coming right up. And to top it off, Titan hangs out within Saturn's magnetosphere, so it's shielded from those pesky solar winds. Now Titan's gravity is about one-seventh that of Earth, which could lead to muscle and bone deterioration over time. To counteract that, our bodies would need to develop stronger muscles and denser bones to withstand the lower gravity. Seems like Earth is the only place where we can't skip gym without gravitational consequences. Now, when it comes to being the hottest planet, Mercury may be the Sun's next-door neighbor, but Venus takes the crown. The temperature there is a scorching 870 degrees Fahrenheit on average. It's like trying to survive in a pot of boiling water or in the fiery depths of Venus itself. I guess the richest people out there would be those selling sunscreens and ice cream! <laughs> Sorry folks, no amount of evolution can turn us into superhumans who can handle Venus's extreme conditions. The only beings that theoretically could possibly thrive there are tardigrades. These tiny cute little critters that look like caterpillars and have some seriously impressive toughness. 
They can survive boiling water, the darkest depths of the ocean, and even the freezing airless emptiness of space. In fact, they were part of a scientific study on a spacecraft that unfortunately crashed on the moon. Still, recent research proves that even these guys won't survive on Venus. Now, look at this guy. He's been kicking it on Mars for ages, which explains why he's rocking the wrong shade of self-tan. Turns out, all those carrot-loving carotenoids in his diet, like sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, and pumpkins, are the aces up his sleeve protecting him against UV rays. The more he munches on those, the more he turns into a walking orange. And let me tell you, his strength? It's all about that Martian gravity, my friend. The gravity there messes with our perception of weight. So if you want to be a boss on Mars, you gotta chow down big time. Like, if you weigh 150 pounds on Earth, it feels like you're carrying no more than 55 pounds on Mars. So overindulging in food can totally help bridge that gap between gravity and weight. Ooh, time to feast like a Martian! At the edge of our solar system, there's a cold and mysterious region known as the Oort Cloud. It's a hypothetical vast area of icy space objects surrounding the Sun. It's believed to lie far, far away from our star, from 2,000 to 5,000 astronomical units. For comparison, Pluto's orbit carries the planet between 30 and 50 astronomical units from the Sun. And there, in this freezing emptiness, a rogue planet may be hiding right at the moment. At least, that's what new research has recently suggested. Rogue planets are called this way because they don't orbit around any star. They wander the galaxy alone, totally untethered. Without stars, they don't have days or nights, only eternal darkness. Rogue planets are usually kicked out of their planetary systems, doomed to a solitary existence of circling the center of the galaxy on their own. Of the thousands of planets scientists have detected outside of our solar system, only a dozen or so are starless and cruising on their own. At the same time, there might be billions or even trillions of rogue planets wandering around our galaxy. If these estimations are true, it might mean that the Milky Way contains more free-floating planets than stars. Anyway, in 1907, one astronomer started a search for Planet X. It's a hypothetical giant planet moving around the Sun beyond the orbit of Neptune. The scientist was convinced that this planet existed because he had observed some irregularities in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. His idea led to the discovery of Pluto in 1930. But the dwarf planet was too small to have any serious gravitational impact on the orbit of Neptune, let alone Uranus. These days, the Planet X theory is largely considered to be discredited, but it hasn't stopped astronomers from searching for planets in the far reaches of our solar system. And shockingly, a new study claims there might be one or even more out there, but much, much further away than predicted. An international team of scientists has recently simulated the unstable celestial mechanisms of the early solar system. They've discovered that there's a possibility that a few planet-sized bodies might have come to rest in the Oort cloud. You see, about 4.5 billion years ago, when the solar system was just forming, it was a hectic and unsettled place. Gravity sent debris from the cooling protoplanetary dust cloud hurtling around like cosmic tennis balls. From time to time, large chunks of this debris, even planet-sized ones, were sent flying far enough to escape the sun's gravity altogether. Such pieces of debris turned into rogue planets. Researchers have seen such space wanderers in distant exoplanetary systems. But according to them, there's a 0.5% chance that one or more of those wayward planets formed in the solar system and ended up in the Oort cloud after drifting away from the sun. At the same time, it's slightly more likely that a rogue Neptune-like planet was snagged by the sun's gravity from another planetary system. And then, this planet came to rest somewhere in the Oort cloud. The chances that this scenario is true reach 
If this turns out to be the case, then a space body similar to Planet X might indeed be hiding out there, on the outskirts of our solar system. The only problem is that it would still be too far away to have any impact on Neptune's orbit. In any case, most researchers are convinced that the Oort cloud is made up of a collection of way smaller icy objects. But given the distance to the Oort cloud and its enormous size, we may never really figure out what is lurking out there. One day, NASA will build a spaceship that can take us anywhere in the universe. Probably. And when this happens, we'll be able to find a new, beautiful home. Scientists even know what exactly they're looking for. We want a planet about twice the size of Earth with an average temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit, with a pretty dense atmosphere. Bigger planet means more room for water and potential homes. And a dense atmosphere means more protection from nasty space stuff, as well as more lush plants and cool animals. Thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope, we can now study exoplanets better from a distance. Of course, sending astronauts there would be much better, but oh well. Discovering new planets isn't easy, though. It's like trying to find a tiny firefly in a pitch-black forest. Scientists had to come up with a clever method to find very distant planets. It's called the transit method. Here's how it works. Scientists capture a series of snapshots of a distant star at different points in time. Then, they scrutinize these images. They try to find any mysterious dark spots passing in front of the star. If they find one, it could very well be a planet. These snapshots hold the keys to uncovering vital information about these distant worlds. Not only do they tell us that there's a planet there, but also reveal its size, radius, and how close it is to its parent star. And most excitingly, they hint at whether it could ever become a new home for us. And now their research is finally bearing fruit. Recently, we've stumbled upon a tiny world nestled in the Cygnus constellation. It's called Kepler 22b. At first glance, it might not seem like a big deal, but this discovery has some pretty huge implications. This planet is located right in the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone, also known as the habitable zone, is a sweet area around a star where the conditions are just right for a planet to have liquid water on its surface. It's not too hot, so it doesn't evaporate, and it's not too cold, so it doesn't freeze. Hence the name from the famous story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So there might be water on Kepler 22b, and where there's water, there's a chance for life. And it's not just about life. Having a planet covered in oceans can be a game changer for climate stability, all because vast water bodies act like nature's thermostats. When the sun beats down on the hot parts, the water soaks up some of that heat and spreads it around like a blanket. The scorching regions cool down and the icy ones warm up and thaw out. Back in the bad old days of our Earth, the moon played a crucial role in helping water puddles spread across our planet. This is what helped our world transform from a fiery nightmare into the vibrant, life-packed orb we call home. Kepler 22b has about the same year length as our Earth. And if we're right about the whole ocean thing, scientists think its average temperature could be around a cozy 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if this world also sports an Earth-like atmosphere, temperatures might soar up to a toasty 72 degrees. This world isn't too far away from us, only 635 light years, which is about three quadrillion miles. Yeah, that's pretty close in space terms. Its sun is a yellow dwarf star, just like our sun, although there's a subtle difference. It's about 20% dimmer, so you won't see this star in the night sky even if you squint your eyes really hard. This star also happens to be quite chilly. Its temperatures are hovering around a frigid 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, making it the Arctic of the starry skies. Luckily, Kepler 22b snuggles up to its star a bit more closely than we do to the sun. If it was in our solar system, it would find its place somewhere in between our familiar Earth and Venus. So the brightness and the temperature on this planet would be almost the same as on Earth. There are a couple of catches, though. For example, 
this world might be quite a gymnast. It could be twirling around its star in a totally different way than Earth does. It might be tilted, like Uranus. If that's the case, the temperatures of the planet could be quite weird. You'll experience bone-chilling winters, followed by scorching hot summers. So let's hope this theory isn't true. If Kepler-22b has a normal tilt, its climate would be pretty similar to what we enjoy here on Earth. The next problem is gravity. Kepler-22b is about 2.4 Earth's size, which means the gravity there would be stronger. You'd feel noticeably heavier on this planet. It would be just like doing your everyday activities on Earth, but everything would require more effort due to the stronger gravitational pull. Simple things like climbing stairs or even just breathing would require much more energy. So it's time to build some muscles. People would have to adapt to the new conditions by having denser bones and more robust cardiovascular systems just to move around comfortably. Unfortunately, that means doing sports would be much harder too. But hey, at least people might need to consume more calories to sustain their activities. So even though you'd have to exercise more, you'll also be able to eat more delicious food. Buildings on Kepler-22b would likely be square and robust to withstand the stronger gravity, which would kind of be problematic because taller structures are super challenging and expensive to build. But the most important question is, what kind of planet is that at all? Yeah, it's the big question mark. Scientists aren't even sure that Kepler-22b is Earth-like. It could be a gas giant or even a water world. A water world is a planet with a vast ocean covering its surface. And it's not just some knee-level deep water. It'll be insanely huge, thousands of miles deep and more, with no visible surface or any plants around for a long time. In that case, we could dream of building underwater cities. We could filter the water for sustenance and perhaps evolve into amphibious beings. Would that be a step backward? or a leap forward in our evolution. Some scientists also lean towards the idea that Kepler-22b might be a mini-Neptune. This is a legit planetary category, by the way, but that theory is still unproven. But let's say for our sake, it's a rocky planet. Even then, we're in the dark about its atmosphere. Does it even have one? What if it's like Venus, toxic enough to make your ex look like a bouquet of roses? In that case, we'd have to dig deep into the planet's depths for survival, figure out a heat source, and hope for the best. While there's a lot we don't know, let's keep our fingers crossed and assume the planet is Earth-like. In that case, what would Kepler-22 look like? Well, because of stronger gravity, the planet's landscape might be full of rugged mountains, deep valleys, and powerful rivers. If there's life on this planet, it's probably quite… small? Unusual plant and animal life should have adapted to the higher gravity. Trees might be shorter and sturdier. They'd struggle to break free from the soil. Animals might be pretty small too. They would also have strong, muscular legs for support. Perhaps these creatures would have numerous legs making movement possible. They'd need to be small in stature but gargantuan in strength. Muscular giant spiders sound not so bad, right? As for our beloved pets, they'd have to become little muscle-bound spheres just to survive. Also, the landscapes would feel very spacious because of the planet's sizes. A three-day flight in a plane sounds like quite the adventure. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer. But let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer the planet. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet or something like that. In a star system far, far away, to be more precise, 2600 light years away, there's an exoplanet called Kepler-1658b. It's a gas giant that resembles our Jupiter. But what differentiates it from Jupiter is that this poor planet is doomed. It's spiraling toward its parent star, which will eventually end in a fiery collision. But the most interesting thing? Astronomers would have remained totally ignorant of this fact, if not for a tiny clue. It was a really minuscule change in the planet's orbit. 
It wouldn't have been noticed if astronomers hadn't compared more than a decade of data received by different telescopes. More precisely, scientists have been watching the exo-Jupiter pass between our planet and its parent star once every two weeks for the last 13 years. And they've noticed that the orbit of the planet is getting smaller and smaller. Every year, Kepler-1658b needs 131 milliseconds less to complete a lap around its star. If this tendency continues, the planet is bound to collide with its star in 2.5 million years. Even before this discovery, computer models predicted that some planets could meet their end by crashing into their stars. But this is the first time when astronomers have some real proof of such an outcome by measuring almost imperceptible changes in a planet's orbit. They now know for sure what happens when a planet is going to crash into its star, even though we probably won't be around to witness it. But let me tell you a bit more about the doomed planet. It was discovered by NASA's now-retired Kepler Space Telescope. It was launched in 2009, and its mission was to find planets orbiting other stars, aka exoplanets. And the very first exoplanet the telescope spotted was the very gas giant we've been talking about. But it took astronomers about a decade to confirm that this space object was indeed an exoplanet. This world is like a denser version of Jupiter. I mean, take six Jupiters worth of material, roll it into a ball, about 1.1 times as wide, and voila! The planet is tidally locked to its parent star, which means that it makes one complete turn every time it finishes a lap around the star. As a result, the same side of the gas giant is always facing the star. It's the same as what happens to the moon. Our natural satellite is tidally locked to Earth. That's why we only see half its surface. Now, what is making the exo-Jupiter fall into its star? The same process that is pushing the moon away from Earth. When a moon orbits a planet, or a planet orbits a star, their gravity forces interact and tug on the other's mass. That's what causes tides on Earth. This tugging releases some energy. It can make an object speed up and slow down. In the first case, a space body will move higher. In the second, it will start moving lower. And this is exactly what's happening to the gas giant. Its parent star is 1.5 times the mass of the sun. So no wonder its tidal forces are gradually slowing down the planet's movement, making it fall inward. This all sounds kind of tragic, but this potential collision is by far not the weirdest thing happening in space. Let's look at some others. For example, Betelgeuse, a red giant in the Orion constellation, started to dim in 2019. This confused astronomers. By that time, the star had already swollen to enormous proportions. If it was to replace our sun, its outer surface would spread far beyond Jupiter's orbit. And then Betelgeuse became dimmer in the fall of 2019. This process continued through February 2020. The changes could be seen with the unaided eye. No wonder, the star's brightness had dipped by two-thirds. At that time, astronomers were sure Betelgeuse was about to explode into a supernova. They continued to observe the star, but unexpectedly, it returned to its regular brightness. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, scientists figured out that the star had ejected some of its material, and this partially blocked its light. How about cotton candy exoplanets? Those are particular planets outside of our solar system. Also called super puffs, they have the lowest density ever discovered. This gives them an airy, fluffy appearance. But despite looking like the most popular amusement park treat, such planets are enormous. Come to think of it, scientists often discover strange things in space. Some of them look like blurry blobs. But there's one type of these blobs that doesn't look like any other known space body. The odd radio circles are only visible in radio telescopes. They might be the remains of supernovae, but some astronomers go as far as to claim that they might be the throats of wormholes. Those are hypothetical tunnels between two very distant points in space. The Juno mission noticed something weird in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. The unusual phenomenon was blue sprites and elves twirling above the planet's surface. These are two kinds of bright flashes of light that appear for short periods of time, mere milliseconds. 
They extend up and down toward the surface of the planet. On Earth, such flashes usually happen at the height of 60 miles above massive thunderstorms. Rogue planets don't orbit their stars, maybe because they don't have any. These free-floating space bodies travel across the universe and can end up literally anywhere. They're also pretty hard to find. Rogue planets produce only weak emissions, but not so long ago, astronomers spotted the smallest rogue planet in the Milky Way. It's smaller than Earth, but a bit bigger than Mars. Fast radio bursts are blindingly bright bursts of radio waves. They pack as much energy as our sun produces in days, but last mere milliseconds. Most of these fast radio bursts come from far, far beyond the Milky Way. But recently, astronomers have detected some originating in our home galaxy. And their source is a magnetar just 30,000 light years away from our planet. If it does exist, nuclear pasta is the strongest material in the entire universe. Formed from the leftovers of extinguished stars, this substance gets squeezed into spaghetti-like tangles of material. It can break, but only if you apply 10 billion times the pressure needed to shatter steel. Not so long ago, scientists discovered that one of the most massive stars in the neighborhood had just disappeared. It was a star 75 million light years away from Earth. Normally, it'd be too far away for astronomers to clearly see individual stars, but only unless they're huge. And the star we're talking about was enormous. It was shining 2.5 million times brighter than the sun. For the last time, astronomers saw the star in 2011. They decided to examine it more closely several years later, but it was already too late. The star had vanished. Such massive stars usually go out in extremely bright supernovae, but astronomers noticed nothing like that in this case. There's a theory that the star collapsed into a black hole without triggering a supernova first. It does occur among stars approaching the end of their lives, but very, very rarely. There are black holes, and there might be many black holes, even though their existence hasn't been proven yet. Unlike their massive siblings, hypothetical mini black holes could be really tiny, not bigger than an atom. Their mass can vary, but just one minuscule thing might have the mass of a thousand sedans. One theory claims that tons of micro black holes could have been created right after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. Some scientists even go as far as to say that a couple of mini black holes pass through our planet every day. More than 7,000 light years away from Earth, there is the Eagle Nebula, a young cluster of stars just 5.5 million years old. The Hubble Space Telescope managed to take an image of several dark silhouettes near the nebula's center. Those are the so-called Pillars of Creation, an active star-forming region. Look, how cool is that? Colonizing other planets is like the ultimate cosmic adventure. It's a challenge that's captured the imagination of humans for centuries, and it's something we've always dreamed of doing. One of the most popular candidates for this role is Mars. And this isn't surprising. Mars is a rocky planet that is similar to Earth in many ways, and it even has evidence of water on its surface. This makes it a prime candidate for human colonization. Many scientists and engineers are working on plans to send humans to Mars and establish a permanent settlement there. But what about the other candidates? There are many planets and moons in our solar system, so why not colonize something else? For example, Ceres. Ceres is the ultimate cosmic treasure trove. It's a dwarf planet, not a full-fledged one, just like Pluto. It's located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This dwarf planet is the closest to the sun, and it's adorably tiny. The entire planet is about the same size as the state of Texas. So why choose it? Because Ceres may be a rich source of valuable resources. The surface of Ceres is covered in craters and other geological features. And scientists believe that beneath its surface, it has a thick layer of water ice, which means that deep underground, it may have an ocean of liquid water. If this is true, 
Ceres could be a valuable resource for future space missions. It could potentially provide a source of water for human exploration of the solar system. So, can we colonize it? And if so, how do we do that? Actually, many scientists and space enthusiasts have proposed this idea. To colonize Ceres, we'd have to use the same methods used to establish colonies on the Moon, Mercury, and the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Don't worry, it's not that hard. We just need to figure out how to adapt to a very thin atmosphere, to extreme temperatures, and pressure, and, well, all the other nasty stuff. But let's stay hopeful. At the end of the day, it all comes down to resources. We'll need water, minerals, silica, and other raw materials. All this would help us to create a self-sufficient colony. And luckily, Ceres is full of these things. So first of all, we could locate the places of residence inside the craters of Ceres. We could build domes there that would protect us from all sorts of dangerous things, like radiation. We could also mine regolith in the asteroid belt. Regolith is a residual soil that appears as a result of cosmic weathering of the rock. Basically, it's something like the surface layer of soil on the moon. Why do we need it? Well, because we could use it to 3D print the base layers next to the ice, so that our bases would be located near the water. We could then use these base layers to print other structures, like houses. We could also collect ice and organic molecules to create water. And by combining water with regolith, we would get soil in which we could grow plants and food. Wonderful! There's also another option. A colony could be created underground. That is, right next to the icy crust of the planet. Now, if in the future we'll be some kind of super cool scientists, we could try to accelerate the rotation of Ceres, which sounds crazy, but would be pretty beneficial. It would help us to create artificial gravity inside the underground colonies. And speaking of gravity, all of these things may sound cool, but let's discuss the difficulties that lie ahead of us during colonization. To colonize Ceres, we would need to overcome a number of challenges. To begin with, we need to develop technologies that will help us even get to Ceres. We need some kind of ships that would be capable of long flights into deep space. For them, first we need to create some kind of nuclear thermal or nuclear electric traction, and maybe an even more advanced type of fuel. Then we'll also need technology to help us sustain life in this small rocky world. That is, tools to extract and use local resources. Also, since there's no atmosphere on Ceres, we would have to wear spacesuits and live in pressurized habitats. And this is only the beginning. Living on the planet itself won't be an easy task either. For example, what about extreme temperatures, or radiation, or the mentioned incredibly weak gravity? The latter is definitely one of the biggest problems. The gravity of Ceres is only 3% of the Earth's. You wouldn't want to accidentally fly into outer space while playing football, would you? But the fact that any jump could send you on an endless journey isn't the only problem. Even if you somehow stay on the surface of the planet, you'll experience the same symptoms and problems as astronauts who hang out on the International Space Station. For example, loss of muscle mass, decrease in bone density, deterioration of vision, problems with the cardiovascular system. Wow. Who would have thought that gravity is so important? So therefore, if we wanted to survive on Ceres, we would need either a bunch of doctors or some kind of artificial gravity. And don't even get me started on how low gravity will slow down production and work. And of course, we can't go anywhere without discussing money. Colonizing Ceres would cost us a huge expense, especially taking into account all of the above. And yet, despite all these things, Ceres still stays one of the best candidates for colonization. For example, Ceres contains lots of methane and ammonia. They can be used as a manufactured fuel or a nitrogenous gas. 
Or you can just mine it there in order to colonize Mars and Venus. Even low gravity has its advantages. Thanks to it, it will be very easy to launch spacecraft from Ceres. We'll waste much less fuel, which means that transportation from Ceres to other planets would be much cheaper and more efficient. So, even if Ceres doesn't become our permanent residence, it can become a good transport hub, something like a spaceport. We could use it as a base for mining all sorts of useful things from the asteroid belt. Then, we could transport all these resources back to Mars or Earth. And it can also become a refueling station for ships traveling further beyond the solar system. Sounds cool and pretty sci-fi-ish, doesn't it? But it seems that any attempts to create a permanent base in the asteroid belt will have to wait. Colonizing other planets is a difficult and complex task. It'll require the cooperation and expertise of many different people, and it will involve developing new technologies and overcoming many challenges. Before we go to Ceres, we need to build infrastructures on the Moon, Mars, and somewhere in between. Otherwise, any attempts to colonize it would be prohibitively expensive and would most likely fail before future missions could even reach it. But the more colonies we create, the more likely it is that sooner or later, we'll build another one on Ceres. This would not only open the asteroid belt to economic exploitation, it would also serve as a stepping stone to the outer solar system. This, in turn, could lead to colonizing the moons of Jupiter and beyond. In other words, the rewards of colonizing Ceres could be great. Not only would it allow us to explore and understand this fascinating world, but it could also provide us with valuable resources that could help us to further explore and settle the solar system. Life on Ceres would likely be challenging, but exciting, as humans would be making a new home for themselves and exploring the mysteries of the universe. Just imagine all the new planet-themed restaurants and shops we could have. Welcome to Ceres Mart, where everything is out of this world! So, if you're a fan of cosmic treasure hunts, Ceres is surely a rich and rewarding destination. Just make sure you bring some weights on your feet so you don't fly anywhere. For decades now, scientists have been discovering new planets outside our solar system. By 2023, we've found more than 5,000 of them, and many of these exoplanets could potentially even have life. Now, if you're ready for a wild ride through space, let's find out what potentially habitable planets we've discovered in the last few years. LP890-9b and LP890-9c. Buckle up, because we're heading to LP890-9, a red dwarf star located a whopping 105 light years away from Earth. This star is quite cool compared to our sun, in terms of temperature, of course. It has a temperature of about 4,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this little guy may be small, but it's packed with surprises. For example, two exoplanets orbiting around it. Moreover, both of these planets are likely terrestrial, meaning they are rocky just like Earth. First up, we have LP90-9b, which was discovered in 2022 using the TESS telescope and later confirmed by the Speculoos telescope. This planet is a super-Earth, weighing in at about 13 times the mass of our own planet. It's also slightly bigger than Earth, with a radius about 1.3 times larger. And if you thought Mercury's orbit around the Sun was quick, just wait until you hear about LP890-9b. It takes about three days to complete one lap around its star. Imagine falling asleep in freezing winter and waking up in hot summer. But the real showstopper here is LP890-9c. This one was discovered by the Speculoos Telescope. It's a bit further out from the star and takes a leisurely 2.5 times longer to orbit than LP890-9b. It's also a bit larger than Earth. But its real claim to fame is its location within the habitable zone of its star. That means it could potentially have liquid water on its surface and a climate suitable for life. Now this planet becomes a prime candidate for studying its atmosphere using the James Webb Space Telescope. But hold on, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for LP890-9C. 
It's also really close to its star, meaning it's full of radiation that could potentially make it less habitable. And to top it off, it's tidally locked, just like our moon. That means one side of the planet is always facing the star and is incredibly hot, while the other is always in the dark and really cold. Scientific models suggest that this planet could be more like Venus in terms of its atmosphere and climate. And Venus is, you know, isn't known for being human friendly. But despite these challenges, LP890-9C is still a fascinating exoplanet worth studying further. Who knows what secrets it may hold? Let's move on to the next candidates. GJ1002B and GJ1002C an international team of scientists led by researchers at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias has found two Earth-like planets just 16 light years away from our solar system. They both orbit a red dwarf star called GJ1002. Our sun is a yellow dwarf, which means that GJ1002 is much cooler and fainter than our own sun. But that's okay. Both planets are very close to its star, so it shouldn't be too cold or dark on them. These planets, called GJ1002b and GJ1002c, are both in the habitability zone of their star, meaning they could potentially support life. Also, both of them have masses similar to that of Earth. GJ1002b is the inner planet and takes about 10 days to orbit its star, while GJ1002c takes a little over 21 days. These planets are great candidates for studying their atmospheres and could even be targets for future missions to search for signs of life. The most important thing is that these two planets could potentially support life, and that's pretty cool. Plus, the fact that they're located so close to us means that we might be able to visit them someday. Well, maybe not us personally, but you know. And maybe one day, we'll even find some extraterrestrial life on one of these planets. Now that would be out of this world, but moving on to the next one. Kepler 1649c Kepler 1649c, also known as the lost exoplanet, was rediscovered in 2022 by scientists using data from NASA's Kepler spacecraft. This exoplanet is located about 300 light years away from Earth and orbits a small, cool star called Kepler 1649. It's about the same size as Earth, and just like the previous ones, it's located in the habitable zone of its star. Initially, the data about this planet was discarded. A special computer program called RoboVetter, written to automatically sift through the volumes of Kepler data, labeled this candidate as a false positive. In other words, the program thought it was just some kind of an error or interference. Fortunately, the researchers double-checked such things, and when rechecking the data, they managed to rescue poor Kepler 1649c. Now we know that this is a terrestrial planet just like Earth. And if it really does contain water, there could even be life there. But don't pack your bags just yet. There are still many unknowns about Kepler 1649c. For example, we don't know what its atmosphere is like or what kind of surface it has. It's also possible that the planet is tidally locked just like LP890-9C. That would be, uh, unpleasant. That's why Kepler-1649C is definitely worth further study. Maybe it turns out to be a perfect place for us to set up a vacation home in the future. Just make sure to bring plenty of sunscreen since the planet is pretty close to its star and things could get pretty... toasty. Kepler-1638B this exoplanet is located about 5,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. It's also located in the habitable zone of its star. It was discovered in 2020 by the Kepler spacecraft through the process called transiting. They basically take a bunch of photos of the star at different times. After that, the programs analyze these photos and look for small spots and dots on them. These tiny dips in brightness may mean that a planet was passing by the star. Kepler 1638b is a bit of an oddball compared to most exoplanets we've found so far. It's about four times the mass of Earth and has a radius about two times that of Earth, making it a super-Earth exoplanet. 
Its orbital period is about 260 days, which is quite close to our Earth, and that's great! Finally, at least somewhere, winter and summer will flow normally. Kepler 1638b could have some liquid water there. That's why it's also a good candidate for further study, to see if it could potentially support life. Let's hope that we'll find out more about this planet in the future. And finally, the last one. Kepler 438b Kepler 438b is an exoplanet located approximately 640 light years away from Earth in the constellation Lyra. It was discovered in 2015 by the Kepler Space Telescope. One of the most interesting things about Kepler 438b is its size and location. It's about the same size as Earth and also orbits within the habitable zone of its star. But there are a few catches. For one, Kepler 438b orbits around a red dwarf star, which are known for their high levels of solar radiation and flare-ups. This could make the surface of the planet too hostile for life as we know it. In addition, Kepler 438b has a much shorter year, only around 35 Earth days long. This could lead to extreme temperature fluctuations on the planet's surface, but maybe it's home to some hardy extraterrestrial life forms that have adapted to its unique conditions, or maybe not. Either way, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. This is a small list of exoplanets that we've discovered in recent years. Now, with the use of new technologies, we'll be able to find new exoplanets much more often. Let's hope that at least a few of them will really be inhabited. Okay, here you are, in the middle of the ocean. It's endless, but you can't see it, because there's a thick fog all around you. Dense clouds hide the huge but dim sun. Is it day or night? You don't know. There's only a gray haze around you. You're alone. Even if you try to swim down, after several hours, you still won't be able to see the bottom of the ocean. And that's a typical water planet for you. I know, sounded kind of dark, but it's not that bad. These water worlds are more interesting than they may seem, so let's take a look at them. The ocean planet is a planet that consists, as you might have guessed, mainly of water, ice, and maybe some rocks. Think of the Earth's oceans, its horrifying depths, the Mariana Trench, and all that. And now, can you guess how much space all the water on Earth takes up? 0.025%, exactly. Now, just try to imagine a world of 40 to 60% water. If you dive in there, the depth can exceed 60 miles. Compared to that, the 6 mile depth of our Mariana Trench sounds like nothing. And yeah, the pressure there will be enormous. It can reach up to 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Very crushing. Now, it may sound scary, but it still would be great to find out more about these planets. Fortunately, according to scientists' calculations, there may be a lot of such planets in our galaxy alone. Well, you don't have to go far. You can find these water guys even in our solar system. Not planets, of course, but moons. Jupiter has Ganymede and Callisto, and Saturn has Titan and Enceladus. The ocean can reach up to 30% of the mass of these moons, although it isn't clear whether these oceans are covered with a thick crust of ice. But we've discovered quite a few full-fledged ocean planets. This is because the conditions in which these planets may exist are very specific. For example, this planet should be somewhere 6 to 8 times larger than the Earth. If it's smaller, it'll have a rocky surface. But if it's bigger, it'll turn into a gas giant. At the same time, it must be in the habitable zone of its star. A little further, and the planet immediately turns into an icy giant or a cold super-Earth. So yeah, these guys are very picky. We first started exploring these planets back in the 1970s. However, since then, we've found only a couple of them. But they're still very interesting. The first planet is Gliese 1214b. It was the very first ocean planet that we discovered. Initially, the scientists noticed only a small dim dot. This dot turned out to be the red dwarf star Gliese 1214 an unremarkable, completely ordinary star that's five times smaller than our Sun and 300 times dimmer. Scientists wouldn't worry about it at all, but back in 2009, they noticed that this star had one single planet. And this planet turned out to be quite strange. 
This super-Earth was two and a half times bigger than our Earth and six and a half times heavier. But at the same time, it had a very, very small density and about the same gravity as our planet. In other words, there were almost no rocks and metals on it. But it wasn't a gas giant either. So there was only one option left. It was covered in water and ice. And that's how we discovered the first ocean planet. Well, actually, we can only assume that it consists of water. That's what the mathematical calculations say. In reality, this planet is quite confusing. It's difficult to explore, and so far, scientists haven't been able to find anything there. No hydrogen, no helium, no water, nada. That's because the outer layer of the atmosphere of this planet is very dense, and it perfectly hides its composition. But even so, it's probably a water world. Gliese 1214b is very close to its star. It's only 0.014 astronomical units away, which is less than the distance between the Moon and us. The year there lasts about 36 hours, and the temperatures, to put it mildly, are just wild. Scientists suggest that the average temperature there can reach 250 to 535 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo, that's hot! Remember the creepy description from the beginning? Well, actually, spending time on Gliese 1214b would be a little different. More like swimming in a steam boiler. Because of such gigantic temperatures, the ocean on the surface will be constantly in a state close to boiling without actually reaching it. So, imagine that you're descending to the surface of this planet, flying through clouds of steam. And then, you suddenly find yourself in the water. What? But when did it happen? Well, that's because the boundary between steam and water on Gliese 1214b will be very blurred. Of course, you won't be able to swim to the bottom of this ocean. But most likely, this bottom is covered with a very thick layer of so-called hot ice. It's like regular ice, but it doesn't really care about the laws of physics, so it just doesn't melt even at gigantic temperatures. And the thickness of this ice can reach as much as 3,000 miles. So that's it for the creepy Gliese 1214b. And not an Airbnb in sight. Now, although we can't 100% guarantee that it's a water world, we still have another candidate for this position. A newly discovered planet called TOI 1452b. This planet, located in the Dragon constellation, is almost 100 light years away from us. It was discovered using the TESS telescope by a group of researchers from the University of Montreal. This planet also belongs to the class of super-Earths. It's 7 times larger than our planet, but 48 times heavier. Again, all this is at a very low density. Because of this, scientists have suggested that almost the entire planet consists of a giant ocean. Here, we were a little luckier. This world won't be just a giant puddle and some thick ice. On this planet, there's probably a rocky surface deep under the water, just like in a typical ocean. Don't get too excited, though. This ocean will certainly be very different from what we're used to. TOI 1452b also orbits a small red dwarf. And not even one, but two at once. At the same time, if the previous planet was close to its sun, then this one, on the contrary, is very, very far away. It's two and a half times farther from its stars than Pluto is from the sun. And it moves at great speed. A year there lasts only 11 days. But we still don't know many things about this planet. We'll probably get some new information when scientists observe it from the James Webb Telescope. Well, that's it. Wait, did you expect something else? All right, all right, I know the question that bothers you the most. Can there be life? Well, this is a difficult question. We all know that water means life, and besides, these planets are in the habitable zones of their stars. So, potentially, yes, there might be life. Not some full-fledged civilizations, of course, but bacteria, fish, and some creepy giant monsters. I mean, you know, why not? However, this is very unlikely. Water alone isn't enough to create life, even though it's very important. There should also be some micro-elements and some minerals. And unfortunately, for most water planets, the composition will only consist of water and very thick ice. There won't be any minerals there. But don't give up there's still some probability. First of all, there are meteorites and comets. They can bring the necessary minerals to the planet. 
The more often they crash into it, the higher the probability that they'll bring something like this into the ocean and thus create life. Secondly, TOI 1452b actually has these minerals. Yes, we don't know how deep the rocky bottom is located there. But if it exists, then surely something could have originated there. Let's hope that new research with powerful telescopes will allow us to find out the truth. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll be able to visit such a planet ourselves. How do people usually describe planets? Massive, freezing, boiling hot, seismically active. Let's admit it, shiny is not normally on the list. Unless we're talking about a world called LTT 9779b, which might be the shiniest planet we've ever seen. This exoplanet, which is basically any planet outside our solar system, is ultra-hot and acts like a giant space mirror because it's covered with a thick layer of reflective metallic clouds. This unusual world is located about 264 light-years away from our planet. And the most amazing thing about it is that it reflects approximately 80% of all the light its parent star sends its way. For comparison, Earth reflects a mere 30% of the light it gets from the Sun. The bizarre exoplanet is even more reflective than the shiniest planet in the solar system, Venus, which reflects around 75% of sunlight due to its thick clouds. LTT 9779b is five times as large as Earth, which makes it the largest space mirror ever discovered. By the way, this world was found by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite mission in 2020. But the highly reflective nature of the planet was uncovered later thanks to a follow-up investigation conducted by the European Space Agency Exoplanet Hunting Spacecraft, CHEOPS which stands for Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite. Now, imagine a planet the size of our ice giant Neptune. It's a burning world floating close to its star. If you stepped on its surface and looked up, you'd see heavy clouds of metals floating over your head, raining down titanium droplets. The planet's size, coupled with its insane temperatures, allow astronomers to classify the planet as an ultra-hot Neptune. Now, a planet's high reflectivity is a quality known as albedo. And in the case of our shiny world, its albedo mystifies scientists. All because most planets that are not ice worlds, or planets with thick layers of reflective clouds like Venus, normally have low albedos. Their atmosphere, or surfaces, simply absorb the light coming from their stars, preventing it from getting reflected back into space. And initially, researchers were sure that LT9779b would have a low albedo. After that, by no means was it an ice world. Not with the surface temperatures reaching 3,650 degrees Fahrenheit on the side of the planet permanently facing its parent star. It was supposed to be too hot for water clouds to form. Even clouds of metal or glass wouldn't be able to form in such a scorching climate. Astronomers expected a planet like that to have its atmosphere destroyed by its star, which would leave behind a lifeless, rocky world. That's why discovering metallic clouds was so unexpected. Of course, researchers were eager to find out how such clouds could have formed. It had remained a mystery until they decided to think about the cloud formation in the same way as condensation that appears in the bathroom after you take a hot shower. There are two ways to steam up your bathroom. You can cool the air until the water vapor condenses, or you can keep hot water running until clouds form. It will happen when the air in the bathroom becomes so saturated with vapor that it won't be able to hold it anymore. So, researchers came to the conclusion that, most likely, the atmosphere of the shiny planet became oversaturated with silicate at one point. And then, metal started vaporizing due to boiling hot temperatures on the permanent day side of the planet. 
But if you think that the reflective nature of LT9779B is its only unusual feature, you might want to hear this. The exoplanet is an example of an extremely rare planetary type, an ultra-hot Neptune. Astronomers have been searching for such planets for decades, but those preferred to remain a mystery. The fact that the planet survived so close to its star might be linked to its high reflectivity. Some experts believe that the metal clouds covering the planet probably reflect light and prevent the planet from overheating and evaporating. Plus, such a highly metallic atmosphere is much heavier and harder to blow away than any other. Now, about 850 light years away from Earth, a planet called WASP 121b orbits its star. This planet is a hot Jupiter, which means it's a gas giant moving very close to its star. And because of such a short distance, the planet is also insanely hot. The average day temperature there is around 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Interestingly, just like our previous shiny world, this planet also has metallic clouds floating over its surface. But that's not the only oddity. WASP-121b has a bizarre oblong shape. Can it be because the planet is tidally locked to its star? It means that one of its sides always faces the star, while the other is always turned to the darkness of the cosmos. In other words, it's always daytime on one side of the planet and nighttime on the other, which causes crazy temperature differences. Researchers think it might be the reason for the metallic clouds. The water cycle on WASP-121b is also pretty bizarre to say the least. On the illuminated side, the atoms that make up the planet's water get ripped apart by the insane temperatures. After that, they get blown by winds moving at 11,000 miles per hour to the other side of the planet. There, much lower temperatures allow the atom to recombine into water molecules. At the same time, the nighttime side is cold enough for metal clouds consisting of iron and corundum to form. When these clouds migrate to the daytime side of the planet, they vaporize and rain down metal on the planet's surface. But if these clouds don't seem impressive enough, I've got more. Astronomers predict that the planet will rip itself apart in the next several million years because of its incredibly fast winds and wild temperatures. Plus, the gravitational pull of the planet's parent star also plays its role in this dark prediction. Since WASP-121b is so close to the star, the star's gravity pulls the planet into a weird oblong shape and makes gases like iron and magnesium leak from the planet's atmosphere. This pull is so strong that the planet is always on the verge of a tidal disruption. If it ever happens, the planet will come apart for good, metallic clouds and all. Just 20 light years away from the sun, which isn't such a great distance when we talk about space, a bizarre rogue planet is roaming our home Milky Way galaxy. But even though this planet doesn't orbit any star, it still has an incredibly powerful magnetic field. It's 4 million times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. The exoplanet also produces amazing auroras. When it was discovered in 2016, astronomers were almost sure they had detected a brown dwarf which is an object too large to be a planet and too small to be a star. But later, scientists got some proof that the space object wasn't big enough to be a brown dwarf. The planet sure is a mammoth among its peers. It's 1.2 times as wide as the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, and more than 12 times as heavy. Astronomers think the exceptionally strong magnetic field helps the planet produce the auroras. But the most curious thing is that they're generated in a different way than auroras on Earth. It might be because the exoplanet's moon helps the planet create these light shows. Another planet you probably shouldn't set foot on is WASP-76b. There, it rains iron on the night side of the planet. 
and the temperature on the daytime side rises up to 4,300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to vaporize most metals. This exoplanet is a bit larger than Jupiter in terms of size and is located 640 light years away from Earth. Such terrifying weather conditions in this world are caused by its unusual orbit. The distance between the planet and its parent star is 10 times shorter than the distance between Mercury and the Sun. In 2021, astronomers announced that they had found between 70 and 170 free-floating planets. Such planets are also called rogue because they don't orbit around any star. And the majority of these huge, unattached planets, each approximately as large as Jupiter, dwells in one particular region of the Milky Way galaxy. It's known as the Upper Scorpius OB Stellar Association. Wow, doesn't it sound like the name of some homeowner's association? Anyway, this conclusion was made by a team of astronomers that used telescope observations from all over the world and in space. They also looked through 80,000 wide-field images taken over a couple of decades. Scientists have estimated there might be billions or even trillions of rogue planets wandering around our galaxy. If their estimations are true, it might mean that the Milky Way contains more free-floating planets than stars. Ooh. This region of the sky is around 420 light-years away from Earth. A lot of amateur astronomers are familiar with it since lots of cool stuff is located there. The most famous targets for astrophotographers include dark nebula like Bernard 68, Coalsack, or Pipe Nebula, as well as the colorful region around Rho Ophiuchi. But let's get back to mysterious rogue planets. They wander the galaxy alone, totally untethered. Without stars, they don't have days or nights, only eternal darkness. Of the thousands of planets scientists have detected outside of our solar system, only a dozen or so are starless and cruising on their own. Recently, astronomers have announced one more finding – the tiniest known rogue planet. The mass of this space traveler is somewhere between the masses of Earth and Mars. The term itself, a rogue planet, suggests that such celestial bodies might desert their stars on purpose. They wander off on their own, carving a new path through the Milky Way. But the reality is much more tragic. Rogue planets are usually kicked out of their star systems, doomed to a solitary existence of circling the center of the galaxy on their own. <laughs> How sad! You see, things get messy when planetary systems, including ours, form. While planets appear from the cosmic dust surrounding a newborn star, they jostle one another around. This gravitational game of pool can easily shove some planets toward the edges of a star system, or eject one or two of them altogether. Then there are also nearby stars that can shove planets around too. Most stars are not born on their own. Clusters of dozens to thousands of stars often appear in space. No wonder that in such a crowded environment, a star with its own set of planets might whisk away a planet or two from another star. After stealing a planet, it can keep it for itself or cast it out into space. At the same time, some free-floating planets might form in a different way with no parent star to help them. They appear from collapsed clouds of gas and dust, just like stars do. But sadly, they don't manage to put on enough weight to start nuclear reactions, the ones that make stars emit light. These objects are also known as failed stars. Hey, who said they failed? And they resemble planets. Rogue planets are very hard to detect. When astronomers want to find an exoplanet, they look for something blocking the light of its parent star. That's usually the planet passing between the star and the observer. But researchers can't use the same technique with free-floating planets because, in this case, there's no parent star. The only way to locate them is to rely on gravity. Now, imagine a line of sight between a telescope on Earth and a distant star. When an object crosses that line, its presence is likely to bend and magnify the star's light. This, in turn, makes the star appear brighter than usual. As for the duration of this brightening, it depends on the nature of this moving object. If the brightening lasts a few days, it's a star. If the duration is about a day or so, it's a Jupiter-mass object. And if it's just a couple of hours, this object is something that equals the mass of our planet. 
But the trickiest part is to figure out whether this object is indeed a rogue planet. It's true that stars whose light such celestial bodies bend can't be their parent stars. They're too far away. But there still might be a parent star, invisible because of the glare of the luminous star. And astronomers have to wait up to a decade for the luminous star to move a bit to check for a potential parent star. If there's still no parent star in sight, then it's proven. The planet is traveling solo. One thing is clear. Without parent stars to warm them, rogue planets are frozen worlds. Even if ice doesn't go all the way down to their cores, it certainly covers such planets with hard, icy shells. On the bright side, maybe free-floating planets aren't as lonely as we think. They might have moons of their own. They probably take them along when they get pushed out of their cosmic homes. Even more exciting, these exomoons might have liquid water. At least that's what a 2021 study published in the International Journal for Astrobiology claims. Actually, I don't get that magazine, but it sounds fancy. But could a free-roaming world find a new home near a different star? Some experts think it's unlikely. The universe is an incredibly spacious place, and even a large star is hardly able to slow down enough to lasso a fast-moving planet. For example, in 2017, an interstellar guest, an asteroid the size of a skyscraper, appeared in our solar system. It barreled through the solar system and just kept going without stopping or slowing down. But what if it was a rogue planet? Would it stay with us? Astronomers say it's unlikely. If it happened, they would be thrilled. Such a research opportunity. But the rest of us would likely be terrified by the implications of having such a neighbor. At the same time, maybe it wouldn't be such a big problem, considering how big and very empty our solar system is. But even without a rogue planet invading our solar system, the orbits of our planets are going to change one day. In 5 billion years or so, hmm, the sun will start to dim. It'll begin to lose its mass until its gravity is too weak to hold on to the outermost planets of the solar system. Neptune, Uranus, and probably Pluto might turn into rogue planets. They will slowly drift away, unbothered by the cold and mostly unchanged due to their already frozen environments. And yeah, I know the scientists demoted Pluto as a planet years ago, but it's still a planet to me. So, sue me. And what about Earth? Oh, our planet will have a different fate, much more tragic. As stars lose mass nearing the end of their lives, they eject gas and dust in all directions. And since our planet is in the way, it'll most likely get enveloped in this scorching stream and vaporize. But calm down, it won't happen for a few more billion years. And who knows where humanity will be at that time? As for now, astronomers hunt rogue planets with enthusiasm. For example, NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is going to conduct a survey to discover more free-floating exoplanets using its powerful techniques of a wide-field telescope. The stars in our Milky Way galaxy move all the time. And chance adjustments of the telescope can help researchers spot rogue planets. But there's one drawback. We won't know the distance to such a planet even if we find one. There's one more mission concept, cleverly called Cleopatra. It might be able to exploit parallax effects to calculate the distances to rogue planets. Parallax is a shift in the position of a foreground object when seen by observers in slightly different locations. To maximize this effect, Cleopatra might hitch a ride on a Mars-bound mission. It's supposed to place it in orbit around the Sun. That's a sufficient distance from Earth, which can help the mission effectively measure the parallax signal and fill in the missing information for astronomers. TRES 2b, or not to be, is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here, it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES 2b is a gas giant, roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 
55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. That's a getaway spot. HD 189377b well, I'm not going to say that again, is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty, blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well, for comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. Better duck! The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70, hey, I can say that one, is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler-70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. Its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. Uh, so pal, like, uh, what's eating you? My mother. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. Hey, you asked. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. <laughs> The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours. And those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf, whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. I thought I thaw that thumbworth. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium. 
located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. And that's winter! Well, actually, I don't know that. Despite dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. That'll test your metal. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Vacation? Nah, let's keep looking. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere, where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. 25 light years away from Earth, in the constellation Lyra, there's a young star, Vega. The brightest and one of the most famous. This star is twice the mass of our Sun. Vega is so brilliant, you can see it even at twilight when all the other stars disappear from the sky. Despite all the star's fame, astronomers have never seen a single planet orbiting Vega. Until recently. Researchers have been observing the star for a decade or so when they spotted a curious signal. It might be Vega's first world we'll know about. If it did exist, it'd be a marvelous place. The planet would likely orbit so close to its host star that one day on it would last around two and a half Earth days. The world would be the size of Neptune, and this ice giant is four times wider than Earth. Or it might even be as large as Jupiter. But the most impressive thing about this potential planet would be its temperature. The place could turn out to be the second hottest world known to scientists. On its surface, it'd be as hot as 5400 degrees Fahrenheit. For comparison, the temperature on the surface of the hottest planet in the solar system, Venus, doesn't rise above 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The only place hotter than Vega's potential companion would be Kelt 9b. The temperatures on this exoplanet don't drop below 7800 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyway, the candidate world would be closer to Vega than Mercury in our solar system is to the Sun. It could result in the giant planet puffing up like a balloon. And then, even metals would melt in its scorching hot atmosphere. Unfortunately, the existence of the sizzling planet has yet to be confirmed. Astronomers think that the easiest way to prove it is by trying to spot the light emitted by the unusual planet. And since we're talking about planets, are there any worlds out there that resemble Earth? Astronomers have discovered and confirmed more than 4,000 exoplanets. But it's no secret that thousands of other candidates are still waiting for their turn to be detected. Of course, not all of these planets are like our Earth, but some are. For example, Gliese 667 CC. This world is only 22 light years away from Earth. Scientists aren't sure if the planet is rocky, but they know the place is more than four times as massive as our planet. The star of Gliese 667 CC is a red dwarf. That's why it's much cooler than our Sun. So, the exoplanet is likely to be in its star's habitable zone. But this idea hasn't been confirmed yet. The Earth-like planet might be moving too close to the star. 
Then it can be regularly baked by its flames. Kepler 22b is much farther away than the previous world. If you wanted to reach that planet, you'd have to travel 600 light years. This world, which is more than twice as large as the Earth, lies in the habitable zone of its host star. But it's unclear whether it's liquid, gaseous, or rocky. Kepler 69c is almost 70% bigger than our planet. It's also very, very far away, 2,700 light years. It'd take you 54 million years to travel the distance that great in a modern spacecraft. Researchers aren't sure what Kepler 69c consists of, but they think it's likely to lie in the habitable zone. The planet's position in its solar system is like that of Venus and ours. But since the host star is only 80% as bright as the sun, the planet shouldn't be affected by its heat that greatly. Kepler 452b is the most Earth-like planet astronomers have discovered so far. It resides 1,400 light years away from our planet. Its host star is very similar to our sun. And the planet, lying in its habitable zone, is 1.5 times the size of Earth. Scientists also think that Kepler 425b is likely to be a rocky world. Are any of these or other planets besides Earth suitable for life? There are 24 potentially super habitable planets and one of them met not one, but two criteria astronomers have for such worlds. KOI 5715.01 is five and a half billion years old and around twice the size of Earth. It orbits an orange dwarf a bit less than 3,000 light years away from our planet. Its surface temperature might be four degrees Fahrenheit cooler than that of Earth. But since the planet's atmosphere might have more heat trapping gases, the place is likely to be super habitable. Another potential superhabitable planet is KOI 5554.01. This world is a bit older than our planet, 6.5 billion years against our 4.5 billion. The exoplanet size is likely to be the same as Earth's. The planet orbits its host star, a yellow dwarf, and the average temperature on its surface is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. What planets are visible from Earth? Mercury is the nearest to the Sun in our solar system. But since this planet is so close to the star, you can only see it just after sunrise, in the early morning, and at dusk. From up close, the place looks a bit like the good old moon. The planet doesn't have an atmosphere, and the temperatures on its surface are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, and minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Venus is the second brightest celestial object out there after the moon. It's one of our planet's closest neighbors. Also, it's the most similar to Earth in terms of gravity, size, mass, and average density. Unfortunately, you won't be able to see Venus's surface from Earth. A thick layer of clouds is securely hiding the planet. Jupiter can be either the third or fourth brightest object in the sky. It depends on Mars, which occasionally shines brighter than the gas giant. You can see Jupiter especially well in the summer. The gas giant's most famous feature is the Great Red Spot. That's an enormous storm that has been raging on the planet's surface for centuries. Even though the largest planet in the solar system looks like a solid sphere, you wouldn't be able to land on its surface. Jupiter is mainly made up of gases, mostly helium and hydrogen. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. It's the last one of the five planets you can see from Earth with the unaided eye. Saturn is incredibly far from Earth, but its unique rings help you instantly recognize this colossal planet. It's a pity that Saturn's trademark feature is only visible in a telescope. By the way, more than 700 Earths would fit into Saturn. At the same time, the gas giant's density is a mere one-eighth of Earths. This is why Saturn's mass is just 95 times greater than that of our planet. What planets in the solar system are closer to each other than the rest? Astronomers believe that Mercury is the closest to any other planet in the solar system. And that's quite shocking because how about Venus? It orbits the Sun between Mercury and Earth. Isn't it supposed to be closer to our planet? Venus is indeed rather close to Earth, but only for a very short period in its orbit. The rest of the time, Venus is much farther away. But Mercury's orbit doesn't let the planet move too far away from the Sun, and it's closer to Earth more than 50% of the time. The same principle works with other planets too. Even gas giant Neptune is farther from Uranus than from Mercury. Most of the time, the two larger planets are on the opposite sides of the solar system. Their orbits sometimes do bring them very close to each other, but it happens very rarely. And how about planets outside the solar system? 
astronomers have recently discovered two worlds traveling around the same star. Their orbits are often so close to each other that each planet looks like a huge full moon from the surface of the other. It occurs every 97 Earth days. These planets are about 1,200 light years away from Earth. Their composition and size are different, but the distance between them is a mere 1.2 million miles. That's five times the distance between Earth and the Moon, and it's closer than any other planets astronomers know about. One of the newly found worlds is more than four times as massive as our Earth. It's likely to be rocky. The other is a gaseous planet the size of Neptune and almost eight times as massive as our planet. Scientists haven't figured out yet how such dramatically different space bodies ended up in such similar orbits. Magma oceans, supersonic winds, scorching hot days, and instead of rain, a bunch of rocks falling on your head. Just another one of those days, huh? <laughs> Astronomers recently discovered a new super planet out there. K2-414b is an exoplanet that's around 200 light years away and in serious need of a new name. An exoplanet is just a fancy way of saying that a planet orbits its own star in another solar system. The Earth orbits the Sun, so this planet has its own orbit party going on. So what makes K2 bunch of numbers so scary? Picture our beautiful little blue planet Earth. Now imagine that all the volcanoes in the world suddenly erupted at the same time and lava covered the oceans and seas. Fiery hurricanes thousands of times faster than normal blow all over the place, 24-7. And it starts raining rocks every now and again. Rocks! Like on your head. Thankfully, not in your head. This scary planet came into our lives about two years ago. Scientists are still studying it. So, what's a typical day like? For starters, you can forget about breathing. Oxygen decided to take a pass on this planet. You'd have to get used to sodium, silicon monoxide, and silicon dioxide. Which is, as you guessed, not great. And that's just scratching the surface. Who knows what other chemicals are lying around? And yes, magma oceans. The planet's surface is covered in molten magma as far as the eye can see. This lava planet orbits really close to its star, which is why the surface is like a fireplace. The closest planets to our Sun are Mercury and Venus, but this planet's even closer. And what's even more weird is that half the planet is in constant daytime, the other half night. It's tidal locked, just like our Moon is. No matter how long you stare at it, you'll never see the other side. That's why the all-day, everyday scorching, fiery side is so hot and overflowing with magma oceans, while the other side's in a constant state of deep freeze. If the magma doesn't burn you, you've still got big problems, and please don't look up. It's raining rocks. On Earth, water turns to steam, rises up, becomes clouds, cools, and falls as rain. Over there, on planet Fireball, it's exactly the same, except for it's rocks, people. The planet's so hot, it vaporizes rocks. Oh, and don't forget the supersonic winds with speeds up to 3,000 miles per hour. Imagine your hat getting blown off your head at five times faster than an airplane. The strongest wind on Earth was the tropical cyclone Olivia that hit Australia. It was blowing at 250 miles per hour. Now imagine 12 times that. On the sunny side of the planet, you're looking at a roasting 5,000 degrees. The hottest it ever got on Earth's surface was in California, 135 degrees. It's pretty common for it to get near that temperature in the Sahara Desert, but that kind of heat's not exactly enough to make rocks evaporate. If you grew up near a desert, you already know how dry and hot it always is. But did you know that deserts can reach freezing temperatures? A desert, by definition, is a large area with little or no rainfall. That means no water vapor to keep the temperatures from going insane. In the daytime, the sun heats up the desert like an oven. But when the sun sets, the heat packs up and heads home, and it can get really cold. Some deserts have even reached minus 40 degrees at night. But wait! Shouldn't deserts have snow if it's that cold? Well, some deserts have had a bit of snow here and there. But because there's no water vapor, there can't be that much snow just dry, freezing, sandy Sahara nights. Now, the Sahara Desert's actually not the largest desert on Earth. It's Antarctica, 
5 million square miles of icy dryness, almost no people, and a whole bunch of cute penguins. Penguins technically live in a desert. Back to the fireball planet, this time the night side. Never-ending darkness and extreme cold, about minus 330 degrees. Add in some supersonic winds? Earth's coldest? Minus 130 degrees at a research center in Antarctica. So how does this jalapeno pepper exoplanet stack up against some of our neighbors? Well, Mars isn't exactly livable either. It's the red planet, so you'd think it'd be hot most of the time. But it's usually freezing. Well, way below freezing. And if you're planning a weekend getaway to Mars, you can leave the umbrella at home. Nah, it doesn't rain rocks, and it actually hasn't rained there for millions of years. At least Mars has days and nights, and it's like Earth in other ways. Mars' equator is steamy hot, and it gets pretty cold at the North and South Poles, just like Earth. Scientists even discovered old bits of carbon dioxide snow there. The entire planet is actually covered in carbon dioxide, with a splash of nitrogen here and there. Scientists even reported intense snowstorms on Mars. But because it's mostly carbon dioxide, it's not your typical snowstorm. It's more like a dry ice storm. That's the stuff they use in fog machines. Mars isn't the only place where climates are going cuckoo. Jupiter's famous for its gigantic storms. Not like the ones we know on Earth. I'm talking about storms that last for centuries. The Great Red Spot on Jupiter is actually a 400-year-old storm, and you could fit four whole Earths inside of it. So it's been around for a while, but it's nowhere near as intense as the storms on K2. Venus also has intense rain, but it's not made of rocks. It sort of works. It rains sulfuric acid. That stuff can give you severe skin burns and rip nasty holes through your umbrella. Venus's atmosphere is filled with carbon dioxide, which acts like a net to trap in the sun's radiation, and it's insanely hot. No magma oceans, though. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun and doesn't even have an atmosphere. That means no storms, clouds, rain, wind, whatever. Mercury is kind of like a desert here on Earth. No water vapor and no rainfall. That means temperatures shoot up during the day and drop like crazy at night. The K2 exoplanets, like the most extreme parts of all of our solar system, all rolled into one scary planet. But we're not headed there anytime soon. We haven't even been to Mars yet. That's all way off in the future, and 200 light years is a really long travel time. If we're going to move anywhere anytime soon, we'll probably want to set up camp on the moon. No magma oceans, no warp speed winds, nice temperatures. So where would we even start? Well, the main issue is that drones and remote control robots are getting more and more advanced. It's way cheaper to send them over to map out the moon for us while we're safe here on Earth. And if we ever want to begin space exploration for real, we'd need a proper space base. And what better place than our little shiny moon? So, why do we even study those far-off planets? What's the point? Well, planets are like people. They're all different ages and live in all different places. The more of them we study, the more we can understand why there's life, aka us, on Earth and not on any other planet so far. When we see crazy new planets, we get crazy new ideas, which can turn into awesome inventions that make our lives easier. Even just going into space gives us new ideas. Scratch-proof lenses, some firefighting equipment, water filtration systems, wireless headsets, invisible braces, that tiny vacuum you use to clean those crumbs in from between your couch cushions, they were all invented to help astronauts work better in space. And now they make our lives better every day. Maybe we'll figure out a new energy source someday, thanks to a far-off planet or star. Or we might discover a new compound that will make our building stronger or more energy efficient. So check this out. Astronomers have discovered an exoplanet they're calling Super Saturn. It's got rings over an AU wide. 
An AU is the astronomical unit, the distance between the Sun to the Earth. That's an incredibly huge ring system, hence its name. Super Saturn is being called Mamajek's object after the astronomer who led the team to whom we owe the discovery. Professor Eric Mamajek of Rochester University in New York found Super Saturn while scouring through data downloaded from wide-angle transit observations. WASP is the acronym for Wide Angle Search for Exoplanets. It's an ingenious project developed in the year 2000 by astronomers at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and St. Andrews University in Scotland. Using four telescopes, the CCD video cameras on the scopes record the slight dimming of starlight caused by objects passing in front of stars. This is called the transit method of exoplanet detection. So, for example, the planet Venus transits across our view of the Sun every couple hundred years. A black dot, the silhouette of Venus, is visible, crossing in front of the Sun as Venus passes between our line of sight and the Sun. This tiny eclipse causes the amount of sunlight coming to Earth to be reduced by a minuscule amount, also known as teeny tiny. The same is true for all the stars in the Milky Way that have planets going around them. Exoplanetary transits in front of stars must be in direct line of sight with Earth for the starlight to be dim. Such transits do not occur very often. That's why thousands of stars must be looked at simultaneously for as long of a duration as possible, between 4 and 8 hours a night. WASP was created to stare continuously at as wide of a range of stars as possible. Maybe one of them would show an exoplanet transit. That translates into a lot of data being produced, about 40 gigabytes per viewing session. Computer scientists at Leicester University in England developed a computer program to store the data and generate photometric graphs of the light intensity of each star. Open University, also in England, joined the WASP project, took this data, and made it available for research by astronomers worldwide. The graphs of the intensity of starlight show that changes in its brightness are called light curves. These graphs have two axes. One is in the timeline axis, the other one is the intensity of light. As the object, considered an exoplanet, though it could also be a brown dwarf star, crosses in front of the star, the timeline axis keeps track of how swiftly it is moving. It tells us how close the object is to the star, while the brightness axis keeps track of how much the starlight dims. This way, we can find out how large the object is. Now, obviously, big objects will dim the light more and be easier to detect. At present, Earth-based equipment is not sensitive enough to measure the dimming caused by planets as small as Earth. Neptune size and larger ones are the limit for WASP. However, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now in operation, has a much greater sensitivity and will be able to resolve the transits of Earth-sized exoplanets. Now, I know you want me to get to Super Saturn, but there's something else you should be familiar with before we get there. If the exoplanet has an atmosphere, or in the case of Super Saturn, a ring system, the starlight from the star the planet is transiting will shine through the atmosphere or ring system, and that can be detected too. The light curve will show less dimming in the photometric data, because not all the starlight is being blocked. Some light is still getting through the atmosphere or rings. This is important because it gives astronomers a reading of the atmosphere. The James Webb Space Telescope is fitted with spectroscopes that can determine the gas content of the transiting exoplanet atmospheres – oxygen, methane, carbon, etc. The WASP project has been really catching on. There's a Super WASP project now consisting of WASP North and a WASP South. One looks at the sky above the northern hemisphere, the other looks at the sky above the southern hemisphere. There's also a next-generation transit survey, NGTS, based on the WASP project. It's automated, so astronomers don't have to stay up all night sipping coffee, but they can if they want to. Located at the European Southern Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the NGTS scans millions of stars and has discovered over a hundred exoplanets down to a size as small as three times the size of Earth. NGTS has started a Planet Hunters Club on social media. 
citizen scientists can search the online database of light curves and perhaps discover your very own exoplanet. What had been a strictly British effort started by one or two astronomers is now a worldwide phenomenon. With the ability to read the spectroscopic signatures of atmospheric gases during exoplanet transits, a new idea emerged – techno-signatures. That is specifically identifying gases in exoplanet atmospheres that are produced by civilizations. The James Webb Space Telescope can do this. Gases from pollution, such as chlorofluorocarbon CFCs, can be seen spectroscopically if present. Tritium from fusion reactions, if they have them, can also be detected, along with heat patterns from cities on the planet's surfaces. Technosignatures is a recent concept that originated after the WASP project started. Who knows what it will turn up? Now let's get back to Super Saturn. The star that Super Saturn orbits is J1407, a small, dim, sun-like pre-main sequence star of the 13th magnitude. Huh? Well, the human eye can only see stars to about the 6th magnitude, and each magnitude is 2.5 times dimmer than the previous one. So it's not an exceptional star, just another telescopic star out there in the Scorpius Centaur region of the night sky. J1407 is a young star that hasn't yet settled into its stable, long-duration phase. This is important because Super Saturn, officially J1407b, is showing signs of having a ring system in an early stage of development. Super Saturn's light curve was tucked away in the mountain of data from the Super Wasp project. Professor Eric Mamajak and his associate, Matthew Kenworthy of Leicester University, studied the data thoroughly and produced a detailed report on it. Knowledge depends on good data. The horizontal axis of J1407b's light curve, the time axis, is what's causing all the hubbub. It took Super Saturn weeks to transit across in front of its parent star. 56 days, to be exact. Planetary ring systems that we are familiar with in our solar system orbit right around the equators of the gas giant planets and are very thin, from only a few meters thick down to a few centimeters. In a telescope, Saturn's rings will seem to disappear when the planet is at zero inclination toward Earth. Saturn must be inclined at an angle in relation to Earth to see Saturn's beautiful ring system. It's something everyone should make a point of seeing – Saturn in a telescope. If Super Saturn's rings block most of the light from J1407 for 56 days, it means that the planet had to be orbiting at a steep inclination to its star. If it were at zero inclination, we wouldn't see the rings blocking any light. Therefore, the orbital time could be determined. 10 years minimum to 200 years if the orbit is highly elliptical. The superplanet itself is calculated to be 24 times the mass of Jupiter, which means that if it is gaseous, it could be a brown dwarf star. Super Saturn appears to have a Mars-sized object orbiting around it, because there is a huge gap in the rings that was most probably cleared out by a large object. The Cassini division in the rings of Saturn is where the moon Mimas has cleared out a path through Saturn's rings. The light curve of Super Saturn has only been observed once. All the exoplanet detection systems are keeping an eye out for it to come back around J1407. No one knows when that will occur. Some astronomers have suggested that J1407b is a brown dwarf star system in itself merely passing in front of, but not connected to, star J1407. An orbital reappearance of Super Saturn would disprove that conjecture. The center region of Super Saturn blocked out all the light from its primary star. This is what indicates that the ring system is new and in an early developmental phase. Over time, the very dense ring mass close to the planet is expected to thin as all this matter gets absorbed into the planet or ejected into space. This is what has happened with our solar system's gas giant planets. The Mamajek object is a shocker. Never before or since has a light curve been detected like Super Saturn's. Super Saturn has added a new chapter to our understanding of the formation of ring systems. So, here's to you, Super Saturn! Hope to see you again soon! Dark, mysterious, cold space. 
comets, asteroids, planets, stars, and something that's lurking over there, far beyond Pluto. Yup, this could be the ninth planet of our solar system, the one people have been wondering about for centuries. IRAs, which stands for the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, collected interesting data back in 1983. It could be proof that Planet 9 is hiding there. No one knows if it really exists, but this discovery helped to build a model to understand this potential planet better. And in 2016, scientists found out that some small space objects in the Kuiper Belt were orbiting a bit oddly. The Kuiper Belt is the outer area of our solar system. It's a ring in the shape of a donut, filled with leftovers from the times when our solar system was forming. You can find this donut beyond Neptune. The objects in that region of space have weird orbits, almost as if a big body with strong gravity is pushing them away. Knock knock, planet 9 again. The theory says it might be 5 to 10 times the mass of our own planet, and up to 20 times further away than Neptune. The astronomical unit equals the distance between our planet and the Sun. Pluto is approximately 40 astronomical units from the Sun. But Planet 9, if it exists, is 400 to 800 astronomical units away. It would take 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years for this mysterious planet to make a single circle around the Sun. This makes it harder for us to catch the space body. There's a theory Planet 9 may have formed between the orbits of Jupiter and Neptune, similar to the rest of the gas giants in our solar system. The gravitational force of one of the two huge planets probably kicked it out of its orbit. Oh no! Then Planet 9 could get ejected further away from the eight planets we know about. It ended up as some sort of icy waste, quite small at the beginning. But as time went by, Planet 9 has cleared its orbit of frozen pieces of rock and dust and finally formed into a real planet. Another theory says that this could be a planet another star lost on its way while it was passing near our solar system. In any case, Planet 9 probably doesn't reflect that much sunlight since it's so far away. And astronomers aren't sure where exactly they should look for it. Space is dark, mysterious, endless, obviously. But if we do find Planet 9, it will be the first solid proof there are more planets in our solar system than we thought. Moving on to an interesting exoplanet, located only 90 light years away from us. An exoplanet is generally a planet located outside our solar system. This one has an atmosphere with water clouds. One year there lasts 24 Earth days, and the planet travels around a red dwarf star, which is way dimmer and smaller than our sun. That's why, even though the planet is 8 times closer to its star than we are to our sun, the temperature there is similar to that on our planet. This exoplanet has a size similar to Neptune. It's also less dense, which means it's mostly made of gas, unlike Earth, which is made of rock. The average temperatures there is 140 degrees, which makes it one of the coolest small exoplanets we've ever discovered. And the cooler the exoplanet is, the bigger the chance we'll find clouds in its atmosphere. Researchers have discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets, but all of them have been found within the Milky Way, at least until now. For the first time, astronomers may have spotted a planet outside our galaxy. They called it M51 ULS 1. Hmm. The planet is located in the Whirlpool Galaxy, a distant spiral galaxy 28 million light years away from us. There was once a huge but pretty young star that got stuck in a gravitational dance with something that could be a dense neutron star, the collapsed core of a giant star, or a black hole. The star's dance partner had incredibly strong gravity. It was feeding on the star, greedily ripping away its plasma. Then something unusual happened. An unknown, maybe even Saturn-sized object passed by and blocked this confrontation from our solar system. Now no one can see what is going on. But this could potentially be the farthest planet we've ever discovered. There's a newly discovered planet outside our solar system. As large as Jupiter, it orbits two stars. And, as we can observe it from our planet, it crosses in front of them both. The full circle around these two stars, which means one year, takes approximately 200 Earth days. On the day of the discovery of the previous planet, scientists also found it had an unusual companion. It's an extra-hot Jupiter with an ultra-tight orbit around its star. The year there lasts only 1.9 Earth days. This planet has a weirdly shaped orbit. Also, it travels in the opposite direction from the rotation of its star. 
If you could travel 57 light years away from our planet, you'd see something pink lurking in the darkness. As you get closer, it becomes bigger and more fascinating. Yup, it's a magenta-colored planet. A few billion miles away from its sun, this guy is one of the youngest planets scientists have discovered. It's only 100 to 200 million years old. It's made of pink gas, similar to our Jupiter. So if you could fly closer to its surface, this gas would envelop you like a thick fog. You're coming closer and going deeper, and the gas is becoming darker, getting a reddish shade. And look at the planet's core. It's super hot. Because of its high temperature of 460 degrees Fahrenheit, this planet is like an oven. The heat is the reason the planet glows so brightly. You'll also notice the sky is hazy pink, with clouds made of droplets of frozen water, similar to ours. There's another exoplanet half as massive as Earth, which is one of the smallest planets we've ever found outside our solar system. It has a diameter of 5,600 miles. For comparison, Earth's diameter is 7,900 miles. The planet in question is mostly made of iron, similar to Mercury. Mercury has a massive iron core and a very thin crust, which makes it an oddball in our solar system. At its early stages, it collided with some space body at least once. That collision pulled its outer layers away, which is why only the firm iron core remained. Maybe this exoplanet participated in a huge space crash too. That's what probably took away the planet's mantle and left mostly its iron core. Or maybe this is just a remnant of a gaseous planet that used to be the size of Neptune. The atmosphere of the planet could be blown away by, let's say, a huge amount of radiation coming from the star. This planet is only 31 light years away from us, and the day there is less than 8 Earth hours long. The planet is only a little bit bigger than Mars. People aren't likely to ever settle in that place because of its extreme temperatures that go up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. There might even be molten lava on the side of the planet that faces its star. Such temperatures are high enough to evaporate any atmosphere, so this planet might have had one in the past. Generally, gas giants like Jupiter can't support life because they have extreme weather conditions, temperature, and pressure. And there are no building blocks that might create life. But smaller terrestrial planets, such as, I don't know, Earth, have more key ingredients like oxygen and liquid water. Plus, they have more temperate weather and other conditions. And still, not all of such planets support life, of course. It's not easy to find a planet with similar conditions as the ones we have on Earth, or at least the conditions that would allow life to develop there. But meet Kepler-22b, one of our most promising findings. It's 600 light years away from us, twice bigger than our planet, and with temperatures of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a so-called super-Earth. It's a category of planets unlike any we have in the solar system. They're more massive than Earth, but still lighter than ice giants such as Uranus or Neptune. Super-Earths can consist of rock, gas, or a mixture of these two. Kepler-22b is within the habitable zone of its parent star, which is less bright than our sun. The planet probably has a rocky core. It may have an ocean, but it doesn't host any life. At least, we don't know about it yet.